and minimalists. It's time. It is time. Time for us to start. Let's do it. According to the script, you go first. All right. All right, go for it. Ready? One, two, three, go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Welcome to episode 140. 140 years we've been doing this, Ryan. Man, time's flown by. Today we're going to talk... You age really well, man. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, well, we're, today we're going to talk about buying things with with intentionality. Right, because as minimalists, it's not like we don't buy anything. We gotta, we all got to buy some stuff. I mean, we haven't bought anything for a decade. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so today we're going to talk about uh, buying things. I got a little bit of follow-up before we hop into these voicemail questions. So last week on the Access episode, Ryan, we talked with Ryan Delk from Omni. And one of the things we talked about were those bird scooters. Oh, dude, did you try it? Uh, yeah, I finally tried them uh, this this weekend. Did we, you fall? No, I didn't fall at all. Oh, I didn't sweet. even come close, which I, I was disappointed I didn't fall because I'm, I'm usually so unstable. Um, well, I think it's just, I think it's a confidence issue, man. Like, you tell yourself you're unstable, so that as soon as you get on something, <laughs> like, you project that. I, I'm just really glad you didn't hurt yourself, man. No, I just, I, I think I have bird legs, so. Did, I, uh, did Bex do it? Yeah, yeah, we, we were riding them around uh, West Hollywood together. Sweet. And uh, we went all over the place. I, in fact, we're doing dodgeball tonight. I might ride one down to our, our dodgeball game. This, it's like uh, three blocks from your house. <laughs> <laughs> Walk-ins for plebes these days. <laughs> No, they are a lot of fun, dude. Yeah. They're so much fun. Are you enjoying dodgeball? Oh yeah, dude. It's uh I'm much worse than I thought. <laughs> I'm much better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um uh yeah, it's uh God, it's a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun and that's that's what it's about. It's about you know, me going, having fun, hanging out with some friends. Um it's not about winning or losing. Uh, because if I didn't make it about winning or losing, then I'd be really miserable. Yeah, it was disappointing <laughs> last week. It was disappointing last hey, week. Hey, dude, we did all right. It was four. And, we were we were three and four. Right. That's not all right, Nicodemus. I mean, it's better than the first week. We were six and one yeah. when someone else wasn't there. <laughs> Bex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to this, Bex. <laughs> no, uh, we just. Uh, I think we just played a better team this, this week they were really and good. um but uh yeah i really enjoyed that one other bit of follow-up we um we talked about you know we, we we're going on next week we're going on the simply southern tour mm -hmm. and uh 100 of the profits are going to the gym city market so we're trying to help build this non-profit grocery store in our hometown dayton ohio which is one of the largest food deserts in the country it has one of the largest food deserts in the country and so uh, if you want to contribute to that you can do so at the minimalists.com slash Dayton. We talked about that for my birthday. We're asking folks to donate. We're, we're already a third of the way there to the $100,000, Ryan. So that's really that's good incredible, news. man. We're, we're, we're a third of the way there. Thank you to everyone so far who has donated that is that's that's incredible man that we're yeah. a third of the way there now I've, I've heard from some people say i can't afford 37 dollars. that's okay donate five bucks if you can donate a dollar if you can every little bit is going to help and if you can afford more great 90 dollars will provide a family with a lifetime membership which which helps us build this grocery store where there are no grocery stores right now so if you yeah. want to hear more about that we'll put a link to it in the show notes if you want to read more about it it's just the minimalists.com slash dayton or you can join us for the simply southern tour next week we're going going out with uh, the folks from Ramsey Solutions. Uh, we'll be out there with Rachel Cruz and, and Chris Hogan and Anthony O'Neill in Alabama and Kentucky and Tennessee. We're doing three tour stops. We're going to talk about money and minimalism. All the details over at our website, theminimalists.com slash tour. Ryan, what have you let go of recently? God. Um, the reason I asked, I did a video about this. Yeah, I can't think of anything I've got. I mean, there's probably something, but I'd are you clinging to everything? Being right? put on the spot, I can't think of anything. Uh, I know that, that's why I was why I, I, that's why I asked because some T-shirts, like I donated because I got some new T-shirts, so I donated some old T-shirts. Yeah, exactly. I did the same thing. So I did. I had a cardigan that I hadn't worn with the ninety ninety rule. I hadn't mm. used in the last ninety days, and I'm like, okay, be honest with yourself, Josh. Or are you going to actually use this cardigan in the next ninety days? And I suppose I could have. I could have forced myself to to wear it, mm -hmm. but I was like, do I want to wear this in the next ninety days? Uh, there was a pair of pants I got rid of as well. 
well uh, that I hadn't worn in the last 90 days, wasn't going to wear in the next 90 days. And uh, I'm back to one and a half pairs of pants. I say one and a half because... You have a pair of shorts? No, I have a couple pairs. I have at least three pairs of shorts because I go to the sauna regularly, so I need more than one pair. I don't wear my pants into the sauna, though. But uh, I just replaced these pants because there's several holes in them at this point mm. and um i've had them sewn and re-sewn anyway um so i just got another pair of pants so these are about to get donated dude i just got um so the i have these uh these like athletic sweats on right they're like the most comfortable pants i've ever had in my life uh-huh. oh maybe i'll save that for the recommendation piece yeah, yeah. of this the, a- the added value portion. but regardless yeah uh yeah for the added value por- uh, portion of the show but um i bought a, no- a second pair of them because they discontinued this pair okay and somehow like the drawstrings got caught up in the they're just all like chewed up and messed up Uh um and these get dirtier like i have to wash these yeah uh compared to like the jeans that i have sure so um i was like man i think about getting a second pair i went to the store to get they're like oh we discontinued this so i got a used pair off ebay Uh uh-huh um which cost me like half as much right but um but yeah dude like i it's i bought something i let something go and i bought something yeah, yeah. Well, and so that that's sort of the it, it, you accidentally stumbled into the one in one out rule, right? Right. I, well, yeah, it was like three t shirts out, one pair of pants in. But yeah. <laughs> well, I, I like that. I, I like setting up these arbitrary rules, especially when we're trying to let go of stuff at first. Like having, uh, if you want to bring one thing in, letting go of ten things at once. You know, the the one in ten out rule. That's a good one. Like forces you to like all of a sudden think about. Dude, how much is this really going to add value? Because I have to get rid of 10 other things, and it helps you let go at, at the same time. Mm. Uh, so um, the reason I asked this question was I did at one of those living room conversations over on our YouTube channel. Shout mm-hmm. out to everyone who's watching this podcast on YouTube right now. What we're, up? We're doing the, uh, the video version, and next week I'm super excited because Matt's going to be in here to film a three-camera version. Oh, my God. So we can, uh, we can have... Uh, different well, angles? Yeah, we're going to have different angles, Ryan. Oh, my God. You're going to look three times as handsome. <laughs> <laughs> right. But anyway, I do one of these, these, these uh, living room conversations because I, I posted this this uh, question on our, on the minimalist Twitter feed. What's one thing you let you've let go recently? Mm-hmm. And we just got hundreds of responses. Nice. I, I guess 187 responses wow. to be exact. And so I, I just printed out a few of these to, to take a look because often we think about things that we let go of. Like I let yeah. go of my, my cardigan or your shirt or this extra pair of pants or whatever. Yeah. But some of these other uh, responses were encouraging. I let I, uh, Oliver said, I let go of the idea that everything needs to be perfect before taking any action. Bravo, Oliver. Um, uh Ive says, I let go of having my smartphone as an apparent organ extension of my hands. Uh, I forget who it was who called the smartphone the 79th organ, but it feels that way sometimes. I, I, I panic. When I I like, oh my God, I I forgot my phone. I'm in line somewhere. What am I going to do without my phone? Right. And, and in a way, like we're much more aware of this organ than we are of the other organs. Like if you didn't tell me I had kidneys, I wouldn't know. I've never actually seen my kidneys. Thankfully. Um, yeah, it's funny for me when I forget my phone, um, I used to panic, but now I'm like, oh sweet. Now I have an excuse as to why I didn't get back to someone. Yeah. And it's a legit excuse. I didn't have my phone with me. Right. (laughs) Sorry. I didn't have my phone with me. (laughs) Yeah. And, and it's, it's truthful. It's not like, well, I'm just going to respond to someone with with that. It's like, I legitimately didn't have my phone with me or it was turned off or, Mm -hmm. or or whatever. Uh, Jerry said, I let go of seven suits, 15 shirts, four athletic warm up suits, and 15 pairs of pants. Who is so. that? 2008 Josh Milburn? <laughs> yeah, seriously. That's light, <laughs> that's light work for my 2008 <laughs> self. Uh, who else? What else? Um, Peppermint Bell said, I let go of other people's expectations. I realize I'm not happy trying to be the person other people think I should be. Amen, dude. Yes. That's yes the, dude, living up to other people's expectations, that is... That is one of the most detrimental things we can do, man. Recipe for discontent, right? It really is, dude. Yeah. Unbelievable. Melanie said, I let go of uh, three-fourths of my closet. My guess is she enjoys that other one-fourth a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, who else? Elise said, I let go of my snooze button. It's a struggle, but I'm getting more done in the morning now than ever. You know what I realized, dude? I don't even set an alarm anymore. Yeah. If I go to bed early, I wake up early. Yes. It's like, it's just how my body is programmed. I was talking to, when I did the Health Problems podcast, I was talking to Dr. Tommy Wood and Christopher Kelly about this, and 
And I actually sleep more now than I did, well, certainly more than I did in my, my 20s because I I wore it as a badge of honor. I slept four hours last night. What are you lazy people doing? Look what I can do on four hours of sleep. Yeah, I can. I, Look how unhealthy I am. <laughs> <laughs> Look what I can do in this unhealthy state. Uh, Bex and I were talking about this yesterday. I think the 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 second biggest contributing factor to my, me improving my health, and you can go back and listen to that episode. It was episode 138. Um, but, and it was the longest podcast that we've ever done, but it's because we had all these little different segments about sleep and exercise and, and, uh, chemical sensitivities and libido and erectile dysfunction and like all of these different discussions. We had little five minute discussions on. So it was almost like having 15 miniature podcasts all sort of, uh, sandwiched together with, um, with both of them. But, uh, what I was talking to Bex about yesterday is, I think sleep is the second largest contributing factor to my improving my health and mm. making sure I'm getting seven to 10 hours of sleep a night. Yeah. Now, now, and I say seven to 10 because two nights ago I got, uh, I got 10 hours of sleep. I, my body needed it. And I remember I woke up at four and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to get up and start writing. And I'm like, am I really? And I, I said, okay, I'm going to give myself permission to get back in bed for half an hour and just sleep and, and see if, if, if this is what my body needs. And I did that again today. Uh, I got up around 4.45 and I'm like, okay, I'll give myself until about 5.30. And at 5.30, if I'm still awake, then I'll, I'll get out of bed. And I, that's what I did. And I, I wrote for an hour. I did some exercising. And so it's like, it's it, letting your body be the alarm clock is mm. sort of what you were talking about yeah. there. Yeah, definitely. And, and letting your body determine, okay, last night I only needed seven hours, but maybe today tonight i need more because it was a strenuous day or whatever yeah i've noticed bex is really working hard now on her um she's like training again so like she is like crazy crazy fit right now uh just doing a lot of endurance and uh like crossfit style sort of workouts and so she and a cardio on top of it but as a result she requires more sleep and Mm -hmm. you know ella she's a tornado Every night, though, she sleeps for 11 hours, sometimes 12 hours in a night. I'm so jealous. I wish I could sleep that, that many hours. But here's the thing. Also, maybe if I was a tornado for 12 hours a day, then I would need that that kind of thing. Mm. I remember, uh, I think it was Roger Federer. It was definitely a tennis player, but I think it was Federer who said, if I don't get at least 11 hours more likely 12 hours, then there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so what he's saying is I have to sleep half the time because of the energy I expend. And so, yeah, letting go of the uh, snooze button is one way to do that. Day X said, I let go of my job. I retired at age 54 last Friday. Nice, congrats. Congratulations. That's awesome. You know, it's funny, I'm reading this book which again is going to be part of the added value portion, so I won't say the name of the book, but <laughs> it's talking about retirement uh-huh. and how the age sixty five and a half to retire mm-hmm. that was that's based off of the government figuring out when you're going to die. Actuary tables. <clears throat> hey, you know what? At sixty five and a half, you got about three years of life left on average. Mm-hmm. Um, we will o- we will have to pay Social Security for only uh, two and a half years uh, because when you turn sixty eight, you're probably going to die. So yeah, sixty five and a half is retirement age. Yeah, and the fact that we have allowed ourselves to accept an age as a retirement age, it's actually, uh, it hurts us with retirement. I was talking to you and Mariah and Bax about this book. I just ordered it. Um, they didn't have it at the local bookshop. Um, uh, bullshit jobs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into that. And if it's any good, maybe we can ask the author to come on. But he, he, he is he in LA? Uh, I don't know where he is, oh. but um, I know he's he's done a few interviews, uh, and a couple of them were in LA. But anyway, he basically talks about how we've invented these sort of rote jobs that require you know an hour or two hours of work a day or a week sometimes or some jobs that require no work at all and then we have to justify that job to our boss repeatedly so we're, we're often living these lives that aren't meaningful doing work that doesn't feel meaningful to us but we have to pretend it's meaningful to the people around us back to what have you let go of recently geekster said i let go of a couple of toxic people yeah man yeah, that's... Those are the hardest things to let go of. Yes, indeed. And and often some of the most important. Because here's the thing. We often think, like, if I let go of this relationship, what am I going to fill that space with, that time with? There are 7 billion people on this earth. And even if you live in a small town with 20,000 people, there are 20,000 other people. 
you can find people who aren't toxic, who aren't, who aren't going to bring you down, who are in fact going to lift you up and support you unless you're making bad decisions yourself, unless mm. you're the to- being the toxic person, which I know you and I have talked about in our past. Quite often, we've been the toxic one in the relationship. Absolutely. And so often it starts with fixing ourselves, but then once we fix ourselves, letting go of the toxic relationship, sometimes the best way to love someone is from a distance. Robin, I like this one. Robin said, there's a small black stone I've been carrying around with me all the time. I put it on a wall yesterday when I was walking into college so that someone else could have it. So maybe that's a a stone that you use as sort of to remind yourself of an experience or something sentimental. Worry stone. Have you ever seen those with the little dimples in the middle of them? You just sit there and like rub it with your thumb when you worry. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, one of the, it's like it was the first fidget spinner. Yeah, exactly. The worry stone was the first fidget spinner. Yes. (laughs) There's the minimal max, the first minimal maxim, Sean. Uh, (laughs) Podcast Sean's writing down the word stones and fidget spinners but the the uh, to me it's a metaphor because sometimes we carry around these things worry stone is like think about the name there the connotation that has i'm going to carry this thing around that helps me worry yeah or, or i'm going to carry around this extra weight that literally does nothing what a perfect metaphor for consumerism or holding on to baggage or holding on to toxic toxic relationships but here's the thing sometimes the things we, we bring in are beautiful but they serve no purpose maybe it did bring you joy and so here's a different metaphor even those things that once brought you joy can eventually just get in the way and it's time to let go maybe someone else can get joy from it yeah. and i think robin robin uh experienced that what else do we have who else let go of something here Let's do one or two more, and then we'll put a link to this Twitter thread in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. Let's see here. Well, that's a a repeat of the previous page. All right. Well, I guess that's it, Ryan. Um, But it's interesting thinking about what what things we let go of often aren't things, aren't material things, aren't mm-hmm. possessions. For me, minimalism was like the, the, the initial thing was the things, but then it was getting past the things and letting go of bad habits, letting go of bad relationships, letting go of distractions. And I know a few people in this thread talked about some of the distractions they were letting go of. You know, mm-hmm. the Facebook account that they were just incessantly checking or a second email account that... Hey, wow. Yeah, so like there are these different things that like we use to distract ourselves, these different habits that, that we formed over time. And letting go of the distractions is something that, that I think resonates with a lot of people. And sometimes we're just distracted by the things in our life, which mm. is a perfect segue to this New Yorker cartoon. Maybe you can see this if you're on YouTube. I'm not sure. I'll hold it up here for the camera. Go off the zoom in. Full screen, then zoom in. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is a New Yorker cartoon. And uh, it has... So if you think about a hunter who has like the trophy heads on their wall. There's like a deer and a... I don't know. What do people hunt? Giraffes? I don't know. Sure. Can you imagine a giraffe head on your wall? (laughs) (laughs) You have to have really high ceilings. Uh, Yeah, rhinoceros head, deer heads, moose heads, whatever they might be. This one, the the caption says, I'm a bargain hunter. And then there's like a... um, like a case of seltzer water on the wall. <laughs> yeah, twelve pack of soft toilet paper. That's great. Dude. Uh, Cheez Its. It's yeah, it's so easy to get caught in that. It's like the Grouponing or not Grouponing, but the um, what do they call it, man? Like the extreme couponers. Yeah, yeah. It, it, just couponing. I mean, there yeah. are people who who turn that into a hobby, and I go out of my way to avoid the the whole sort of coupon discount thing. If it's there and it's available, I will certainly use it. I'm not gonna turn away free money but i'm not going to buy something because it's a bargain and right. just because i have a coupon that shouldn't be the thing that tips the scale toward buying the thing mm. what should tip the scale is it does this add value is it going to serve a purpose is it the best use of my my money not yeah. not uh oh it's 15 percent off i'd be dumb not to buy it right because of course it's a hundred percent off if you if you don't buy it. Anyway, we should probably dive into these voicemails. What do you think, Ryan? Let's do it. Our first question today is from Jacqueline in Detroit. I'm struggling with my minimalist journey. I started out, and when I found you guys, it was like a breath of fresh air. 
and now I seem to be really struggling with putting this into use 100% of the time. Most of this lends to consumerism. So I believe that I'm shopping compulsively, um, and I don't know how to stop necessarily. You know, the Ikea monologue Mm -hmm. from uh, Fight Club when they talk about this couch, like, once I get this couch, I'll be fine, or what lamp defines me. Uh, that's totally me, and I don't know how to stop it because reading about it or listening to you guys, I'm totally on board philosophically, but then when it comes to putting it into practice, I have these moments of weakness where I just revert back, and I do not know what to do. So, Ryan, tell me what you think about this analogy. I was thinking about this. So, so Jacqueline's saying, you know, she's talking about shopping compulsively. She can't apply uh, apply minimalism 100%. Um, and and she's struggling to like sort of feel complete as if the next purchase is going to, to make us feel complete. Mm-hmm. And, and the the analogy or maybe metaphor here of, of dieting, I, I often think about um, there isn't a, there probably is not a perfect diet for anyone, although it's highly individual, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but minimalism isn't sort of the, anorexic equivalent of of dieting right my, my partner rebecca she she's a dietitian and a nutritionist and, and so she has clients that she works with and several of whom uh, struggle with anorexia and, or, or, or bulimia and she's worked with a lot of college students back when she was at the university for a decade mm-hmm. who who struggle with those and that's not it that's not a, a diet. That is a, a, a disorder. The same way that yeah. hoarding or OCD can be a disorder. I, I have OCD, and and minimalism has helped me sort of keep that under control in a way because it's it's been easier not to to. Uh, there are two sides of the sort of OCD spectrum. I finished watching that show that you recommended during the added value. Um, Evil genius. Oh yeah, and there are several hoarders in there, yeah. and and that's just that that's a type of OCD mm. in a way where mm. it's like compulsively holding on to things, right? right? And and I, I think about OCD or minimalism that is not they're not the same thing. People often mistake minimalism to fr- with having nothing, living as a ascetic, mm. and. I, I don't want Jacqueline to think that like, well, I, I can't apply minimalism 100% of the time, so I, I can't apply minimalism at all. Um, I, I don't think it's about, I don't think it's about stopping shopping because she's, how do I stop? It's about figuring out what things are appropriate to buy. Yeah, it Am sounds I like, right there. Uh, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It, to me, it sounds like she is using shopping as a pacifier. And I think the way I interpreted the question was: is how do I stop using shopping as a pacifier uh, to, to stop those impulses? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree with you 100. percent We do not have to stop shopping. It's not about uh, you know, becoming a minimalist and never buying anything again, or becoming a minimalist and buying only used items, or uh, like you said, there isn't this this um, uh, there is not this totalitarian set of rules that each minimalist has to abide by. Just like diet, right? Like right. there is not. Well, here is the diet you must follow. There are right. some that will work better for others that, uh, that, that for certain people than other people, right? And especially like say Jacqueline's got you know, a husband and six kids, like what they buy as a family is going to be much different than what Mariah and I buy as a family. Sure. So, uh, yeah, just blanketing any type of rules. Um, I don't think is going to really, I don't think that's going to help Jacqueline here. I think, I think what's going to help Jacqueline is, is her finding better habits to replace shopping with. Yes. So shopping as a dude, it's tempting for me as one of the minimalists living in Los Angeles like when I'm bored, I have totally had, I'm going to go to the Apple store because now it's three blocks from my place. Right. It's not, you know, it used to be three hours <laughs> from my <laughs> you place. You to drive was, through two states to get there. <laughs> to get there. You're like, how do I get to and, Spokane and this week? And now it's three blocks from my my, my place. And every, and you know what? I think the last, I, um, I lost... Damn it! I lost. I lost my AirPods, mm. so I went to replace them. I almost lost mine twice in the last two weeks. Dude, but I found them both times. I really hope that someone just like picked them up and they're using them. But I like my fear is that they fell out out and like now they're in the the cushion of this 
like it buried in this couch in this uh, uh, Airbnb I was staying at. Anyway, I went to the Apple store. This was a couple months ago and went in there to buy the AirPods. And dude, like it was so hard for me to like walk out with just the AirPods. But but my my I'm kind of going down a rabbit so, hole. No, here. no, no, that's, that's good. So what what did you see there that you were, that was like? Compelling? Oh, dude, they had like they had really good Bluetooth speakers. They had you know the iPhone X. Uh-huh. They had or the iPhone 10. They had um uh, uh, uh cases and um protectors and Bluetooth gadgets that will hook to your phone and computer. And I mean, it's just like this this world of convenience new computers that they yeah that they offer you at at the at the apple store yeah it's funny i i, I was listening to someone recently they were talking about how they went to the apple store and they actually they were shocked because the the per, oh, it was duncan trussell he said that uh he went in there like to replace his computer and the the person at apple was like uh, what are you using it for and he's like well i you know i write on it and i i, I edit a little bit of audio and they're like, well, this the computer you have is only four years old. It's fine for what you're doing right now. Is there a reason you want to upgrade? Mm-hmm. And I, like, my mind was blown that this company, who sells more products than any other company on the face of the earth, can say, hey, maybe you don't need the new product right now. Right. Um, and th- that that's a, a good thing. Now, it was just it's not the company that said that. It was one individual who said that. I don't know if that's their corporate ethos or something. Right. But it made me realize, like. I anytime I go to Apple store like uh, I had um a Apple Care issue a few months ago and I had to bring something in there and I immediately looked at like oh look at the shiny new MacBook I I mean I've got my my uh MacBook Pro or whatever the hell it is the, the my laptop that I've had you know we we bought them at the same time t- 2014 maybe I don't Yeah it uh, was yeah it was uh it was when we took Sean on yeah, so 2013, 2014, Whatever somewhere around it was, there. yeah. And, and we, we all have the same computer, basically. And I But I go in there, and I'm like, oh, that one is shinier than mine. Mm-hmm. And look at the, the keys on it are slightly different, and it's more aerodynamic. Aerodynamic? Am I going to throw this thing? What am I doing? <laughs> it's faster. <Yeah. laughs> Meaning it'll go faster through the air. Yeah, I can run faster with it. Yeah, I'm not running anywhere. What that's am pretty I doing? Funny, man. Yeah. So, so for me, man, like the way the way that I avoid like I guess acting on that impulse to go shop or to go even a window shop man like that's tempting dude I I mean there are um there's a plethora of places to shop here in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. and uh window shopping even that that's just gonna that's going to um develop the desire even more it adds more temptation right exactly so uh for me like I I try to stay as active as possible, whether it's working out, whether it's going on walks, whether it's mountain biking, whether it's surfing, um, whether it's going to your house to, to watch a movie. Yeah. Um, I, I try to, to fill my time with as many, um, get that extra time, I should say. I try to fill my extra time up with as many uh, either active things or uh, communal things where, where I'm experiencing something with, with a friend or with the community. But but yes, sitting around and, and and doing nothing and being bored, watch especially watching TV, like that is that right there is going to make you want to shop more. Yeah. So here's a, here's what I would recommend for Jacqueline, is if she wants to curb this desire, mm-hmm. first and foremost, Jacqueline, get as many advertisements out of your life as possible. Mm-hmm. So how does Jacqueline do that? Get rid of cable. Get rid of it, or watch only the stuff you record and fast fast forward through the commercials. Yeah. Um. Uh. Pay the extra three, four, five, however many dollars it costs to get the ad free version of whatever it is that you're using to entertain yourself. Pay that extra little bit to yeah, cut the advertisements I do that with, out. With YouTube, I find uh, YouTube awesome. Premium, and it's like twelve bucks a month. And it's the best twelve dollars I spend every month. Absolutely, Be- because I, there is not a single ad ever unless someone tries now people are doing the sponsored things and so like if we were doing ads on this podcast all of a sudden you like our youtube channel we could be making lots of money if we had ads turned yeah. on on our youtube yeah. channel but it doesn't align with our ethos so we have those turned off so even if you watch our videos on the free version you don't get served up ads right uh unless youtube does something without our permission so right right right. <laughs> but 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 jacqueline think about all the ways that you take in advertisements use an ad if you're not using an ad blocker for anyone out there if you're not using an ad blocker 
It's free. Yes. Just Google free ad blocker mm -hmm. and pick the first one that comes up. That's what I did. Uh, in fact, um, Sean, in the show, I don't know what the name of my ad blocker is, but I'll figure it out before the end of the show. And Sean, if you could put that into the show notes, put an ad blocker under your computer. But Jacqueline, all the advertisements that you see, they are affecting you. Mm -hmm. They are seeding in your conscience. They are making you want to buy things. They are giving you, they're adding to this impulse that you already have. They're playing to that impulse. So, so the first step is get rid of as many advertisements as possible. Yeah, and the thing you talked about with uh, replacing, I really like that, Ryan. So, so you, it's not about stuff. Stopping, just stopping, because then it's going to be hard. If like you just stop shopping and they now I'll stand here stoically and do nothing, well that that that's not reasonable because you're just now you're, gonna, you're gonna, just going to ruminate about the things you're not purchasing. So I think it's about replacing. And so some questions yeah. to ask there is what can I replace this with? Right. Because shopping is an activity. Mm -hmm. So what are the activities? It might be dodgeball. It might be hiking. It might be you know, going to the aquarium with your kids. I, I I don't know what your life looks like, but what do you want it to look yeah. like? And then absolutely, maybe it's meditating. Exactly. So, I mean so, that meditation alone will help with those impulses. Yes, uh, although. Meditating alone, if you're just doing that, you'll probably ruminate at mm. first. And so I, I find activities that help you stay focused and then peppering in the meditation because, sure. uh, will be really helpful. And then and so meditation is a definitely a more meaningful experience than shopping. Mm. We both agree with that, right? Yeah. So so maybe the question to ask then, if you're getting ready to go shopping, is what is a more meaningful experience than this? Mm. And if you ask yourself that question, you're gonna that's a better question. You're gonna start getting Dude. better answers. Yeah. Sean, also, please put in the show notes the, the links to the meditations that we did for the 10% Happier app. Yeah, the, I, well, the 10% Happier app. And then uh, if you are a Patreon supporter, we have a, a meditation on there. Uh, we have one meditation on our, on our Patreon page. We'll probably do some more in the future as well. But yeah, they're just like two, three... Uh, what's the longest one we did? Five minutes, maybe? Uh, yeah, nine minutes or something like that. Yeah, that, that is just a meditation on not consuming anti-consumerism meditation so yeah. okay so that, that that's another thing Jacqueline can do is find something to change your state when you get that impulse yeah. so maybe you want to go buy the latest greatest stylish lamp mm -hmm. and uh, you get that impulse stop yourself listen to a three minute meditation whether it's Josh and I's meditation or someone else's it doesn't matter change your state somehow stop for three minutes to reconsider yeah. and if you still feel and go buy the lamp afterwards okay great change your approach next time but you got to find some way to to interrupt that impulse that you get I like that podcast Sean if we could get that other meditation we recorded for Dan and put it on our Patreon feed that way we'll have two meditations up there both meditations that we did so you can find those on his 10% happier app as well uh, and and then if you're a Patreon supporter, you can find them on our Patreon page. You just click on, uh, there's different tags. You just click the meditation tag. We'll put it on there shortly after this episode goes up. So within a week of this episode going up, we'll, we'll put the the other one, the other anti-consumerism meditation up there for you. Um, and a couple other things I recommend, uh, Ryan, here, or just recommend thinking about really, is that you'll never be complete right mm -hmm. the, 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 that that couch that you buy will not make you more complete it will not make you a better human being mm. ideally though for we buy the right things for our life they will enhance they'll amplify uh they'll augment our experience of life sure you came over to my house we had movie night uh this uh, this past weekend me you and, and bax and mariah and and we sat on a couch and so we didn't sit on just hardwood floors or or, or you know, so that that couch augmented our experience for the evening we drank water out of glasses instead of putting our head under the faucet right um we <laughs> maybe you guys did <laughs> <laughs> we, hypocrite we, we ate dinner off of plates yes hypocrite. instead of just pouring the food onto the table um no of and, course of and, course and, we need some stuff man and, and those things augmented our experience however let's say i bought more plates and i had seven sets of plates at my house that wouldn't have improved our evening at all in fact it probably would have just gotten in the way because then all of a sudden i'm thinking about which plate should we use this this evening should i break out the fine china tonight mm -hmm. i like this idea uh rob and Kristen bell uh they uh they always use the fine china like they got some really nice china for their wedding gift or some anniversary thing or whatever so even our regular just normal breakfast nice. meals they'll break out the really because they're like use the nice thing 
things as opposed to just storing them long term. Yeah. Uh, use the things that you have. If you're using them, if they serve a purpose or bring you joy, then great. Also, the author, uh, Christina Cook, she, she talks about, we'll put a link to... Uh, her website. She also has a book called "The Joy of Missing Out." It's sort of the the opposite of the fear of missing out. Mm. It's the the joy. It's Jomo. Yeah, yeah. It's Jomo. And if you can't get, <laughs> instead of FOMO, well, that, that's that, that's yeah. the yeah. Instead of FOMO, it's just, so we all have the fear of missing out because it's like, how can I be more complete if I just buy the thing, this thing, this thing? I'll be more complete. Mm. And if not, I'm missing out. I need to check the tweet. I need to check this. And, and it's the reason I don't have social media on my phone is because I always feel like I'm going to be like. Oh, I gotta check the next thing. What did people say to my Instagram post? And who and like I just get caught up in the missing out. Uh, and and so maybe there's a joy of missing out uh, that that Christina Crook talks about. But I think there's a step in between what I would call WOMO. Okay. The welcoming of missing out. So maybe you don't get the joy yet, but you just bask in the fact that yes. You, you pause and you let out the breath. Ah, I am missing out. I am missing out. It's all right. Yeah, I'm going to welcome this. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. Because no matter what, even if you get that couch and you get all the knickknacks that's going to make your life perfect, it's not going to be perfect. No, and you're still you're still missing out on 99.999% of everything else that's out there. And letting go is really hard, right? So we did, we went through the whole thing of of what have you let go of recently? That's that's a hard exercise and it gets easier the more you let go. But how about yeah. this? Not buying something is your future self letting go in advance. Yeah, or, or you're letting go of that impulse. Yeah. Yeah. You can tweet that, Sean. That's a minimal maxim for you. Not buying something is your future self letting go in, in advance. So it's like saving money now so you don't have the, the interest compounds. This is sort of like reverse interest in a way. You don't have to let go of the thing you don't buy. Yeah. And and so think about it that way is do I really want to have to deal with this later? Do I want to deal with the packaging and the charging of the thing? And do I want to have to deal with once this thing is uh, not serving its purpose or maybe it's never actually going to serve its purpose. I just got really excited. It was an aspirational mm. purchase. Yeah. You know, you're at the Apple store and you're like, oh, but I could use the Bluetooth thing and the, the, the cable and maybe that case will do this. And then you're like. But when I really think about it, oh, that's what someone else would get from it. That might not be what I would actually get from, yeah, from it. Yeah, exactly. The, another thing that Jacqueline said that stands out to me, she said, you know, she's bought in, you know, with the philosophy of minimalism, um, but, but having a hard time acting on it. You know, I thought I started thinking about, like, I used to be bought into the idea of exercise. Mm. I used to be bought into the idea of healthy eating. Yeah. And uh, you can be bought into an idea if you do not take action then it is just an idea. And uh, I think Jacqueline should look at this as diet or exercise. Like what what can you do to start taking massive action towards living a more simple life? Uh, and I, we're going to talk about here in a little bit um, kind of some stuff that we consider before we buy before we buy things. And Jacqueline, you can use, you know, the, the things that we consider or you can make up uh, your own structure. But I know when it comes to diet, I have to have a structure to my diet. Yeah. Um, it, it's a very simple structure yeah. uh, with exercise. I have to have structure with that. Like Mariah and I, we, we get to the gym or we try to work out. Not even try. We do. We work out at least five days a week. Mm -hmm. Hands down, at least for 45 minutes, five days a week. Uh, this week, it'll be seven days this week. Yeah, um, that's it, great. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And like that structure is what will help us to continue to live uh, a healthy lifestyle and continue to be in that exercise routine. And I'll tell you, as soon as like we go on tour, Mm -hmm. Dude, I am not going to be able to work out seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And when I come back, it's going to be harder for me to get back into that structure. I think you will be able to. Though. I think since you've set up this structure and you mm -hmm. feel really good about it, it may not be the same workout. Right. But you can hit the elliptical for 45 minutes as soon as we get to the Hampton Inn or wherever we're staying. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess what I'm saying, though, is that sometimes the structure will fall apart a little bit. Yeah. And uh, Mariah and I, we have to really, really rely on on those boundaries we set up for ourselves. Uh, if we don't, then we will quickly just be on the outside looking at the idea of exercise instead of actually exercising. Absolutely. Jacqueline, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. You mentioned Ikea from Fight Club. Well, there's an Ikea scene in Everything That Remains as well. So it's my marriage ends, my mother dies both in the same month. And of course, in order to deal with it, in order to cope, 
while Rome is burning, I am shopping at Ikea and uh, going through like all the accoutrements I'm buying for my new apartment so I can make sure my life is complete. Of course, there are a bunch of lessons I learned from that. And uh, that scene, I think, will be really helpful for you because it, there were there were certain epiphanies that I experienced in that chapter and then the several chapters thereafter. So podcast, Sean, if you could reach out to her and send her an audiobook version of Everything That Remains. It's my favorite thing that we've ever created. Uh, if you like our podcast, you'll like the audiobook version. Or if you want the ebook version or the book, 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 book version, then uh, we'll be happy to send that to you as well. All right, our next question is from Leslie in Denver. I have two quick questions for you guys. Um, one is that I was hoping you could recommend some brands that you find value in for when we actually do need to buy something, especially if we've gotten a red of a lot of things that don't add value. So what are some valuable brands that are maybe environmentally friendly or really good quality that you guys would recommend? And two, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about balancing your time to try to pursue a passion. If you still are working a nine to five, um, finding a hard time fitting in health and passion and relationships and balancing it. All right, Ryan brands that you trust is it coke or is it pepsi <laughs> rc <laughs> <laughs> royal crown i i, I worked that's at, a dumb question josh <laughs> well I, next I, dumb question you're such a hipster <laughs> <laughs> sam's cola you, you have a 14 ounce bottle of rc <laughs> <laughs> so i um i i uh, worked at americana uh in middletown ohio when i was 13 um yeah, it, because uh, you're allowed to work at 13 back then, apparently. Yeah. And uh, it was that summer I was turning 14, so it was right before high school. And um, we had like the generic version of everything, right? It was just like it was the generic version of Six Flags or Kings <laughs> Island or whatever. Well, yeah, well, Americana was the, gene the generic I know. <laughs> version in itself. <laughs> yes. So, of course, I wonder what that place looks like right now, dude. Uh, there are videos on YouTube right now of Americana. It's also called, if you all want to look it up, La Swordsville Lake is what they rebranded as for like two years. But uh, it closed in, I think, 02 or yeah. 99, maybe. So it's been sitting there for over a decade. It's, it's a ghost town. Almost 20 years. Yeah, they sold off all like the roller coasters and stuff. So it's, I don't know, maybe, maybe because we have at least a certain a little bit of clout, we can throw around the Netflix name from our last documentary. Maybe they let us in there to film some stuff. Maybe, dude. It's like, and it's so sad and nostalgic because I remember like, but that's the danger of nostalgia. Like, I don't get any value from the place, but right. of course I've been on YouTube looking at old videos of <laughs> so, it. So I derailed you from yeah. uh, the generic brand of everything. Yeah, well, they, they were like, they were like sponsored by RC. There was RC. <laughs> <laughs> there was RC. RC had like four sponsors. No wonder like yeah. they're not... I mean, they chose Americana to sponsor. Right. <laughs> well, here's here. So here's the thing, uh, and I think they own Seven Up. I assume they still do. I, that that was like their big thing. Oh, like, do they own? 7 yeah, Up? Yeah, yeah. I think Seven Up was interesting. So and it, here here's the, my my point in bringing up the whole Coke Pepsi Seven Up thing mm. is like just because it's a brand doesn't make it a good thing. Those are all terrible things. It, those are just sugar. Those yeah. things are bad for you. Yeah. And so a brand doesn't make it trustworthy or good it just makes it a brand yeah i mean if here's what I'll, leslie i would say go listen to episode number 56 yeah uh that is where josh and i do talk about some brands it's specific to clothing right but again those are preferences exactly a brand is not going to uh a brand itself is it going to make you better or worse right um it is just a brand but what's funny is like the the way i and maybe i interpreted the question wrong josh you tell me but the way I interpreted the question was, is how can I buy more responsibly? Like what, what, uh, what brands mm -hmm. are more responsible for the environment? Okay. What brands are more responsible? If you want to have more, if you want to be more responsible to the environment, consume less. Yes. There is not a brand that is going to save the environment. Right. There well, is, in fact, there are, there are brands of like, uh, well, it depends on what you mean like, by, by brand too, right? Like there are brands like the Against Malaria Foundation is a technically a sure. brand. Sure. I, I guess I'm talking about when it comes consumer to... Consumer goods. Yeah, consumer goods. When it comes to a brand with consumer goods. Uh, but there are, there are brands like with paper plates and bowls. Like there's this new thing where it talks about this is a net positive for landfills. Uh. When you bury this bowl... With other garbage, it actually helps the other garbage decompose faster. With that logic, we should be 
we should be airdropping these paper bowls <laughs> into all the landfills and all over the world to, to start healthy <laughs> decomposing. What landfills are gone now, right? right exactly. There isn't even a landfill. So, you just wrap up all your trash into this paper plate and it disappears. Now, I think to a certain extent, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to like diss any brands to do that because I think to a certain extent, they probably do have a point and there's science to back up how it will help other things decompose but ultimately if you want to be responsible to the environment yeah. switch to one car yeah. uh, and, and buy so, less buy less things go ahead and it's certainly better than than you know putting plastic in a landfill so so the question is can we be more responsible with the things that we that we purchase yes and i think it what it comes down to are those individual things right mm-hmm. uh, um not necessarily a a brand yeah per se. i mean and when i think of brands that i don't support uh-huh. it usually gets into a political realm mm. and well that's that's just divisive so i'm not going to talk about that here on the podcast right but my point is is that y- y- when i consider brands it's u- it usually doesn't have to do with um you know what's going to have a better impact on the environment because when i think about brands like you know uh, like a, a pc versus a mac they're both pretty crappy for the environment yeah. So uh, what I do is I'll buy a computer because we, you know, I need a computer. Right. And then I hold on to it for the absolute longest time I can hold on to it. Right. And uh, when I can replace it, I'll replace it. So I, I mean, my point is, is that there are things that no matter, no matter what which brand you buy, that company may not be the most responsible company on the on the planet. Hmm. Uh, don't leave it. Don't leave it to the company to be responsible with your consumer purchases. Leave it up to yourself. Ooh, that's pithy. Yeah, Podcast, I'll put that in there. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, when I think about brands, I think about this essay from our friend Colin Wright. And he wrote this essay a while ago from uh, 2012. It has an update in 2017. And it's called Loyalty or Happiness. And it goes a little something like this. Brand loyalty demands that you keep buying products from a specific company no matter what. You like the brand, so why wouldn't you support their efforts? Think about that for a moment. Brand loyalty means that even if another brand has a superior product, you'll continue to buy the inferior one. In fact, it generally means you won't even acknowledge the other product's superiority or existence in the first place. You'll spend your money where you've spent it before because that's where you've spent it in the past. That's a bad reason to buy something from a brand. Well, I bought it before, so I'm going to buy it again. Now, don't get me wrong, past performance can be indicative of potential future performance, but it's not always indicative of future performance. Dude, there is Craftsman is a great example of that. Like uh-huh. I like I'm not a tool guy. Craftsman is a a, a brand that's a brand of tools. Makes tools. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a tool guy, but this is a brand of tools that back in the 80s, early 90s people went nuts for yeah it was this very uh you know not only was it american made but it was this uh very very reliable good quality product Mm -hmm. and so i know tool guys who when they had to you know in the early 2000s they had to replace their craftsman stuff Mm -hmm. or buy new tools for whatever job they needed and they just bought craftsman because of the brand loyalty right well craftsman they know that they had their loyalty so what craftsman did at a certain point is they now things are not all built in america and the quality has gone way, way down because they don't have to rely on the quality of, the quality of their product because they've done such a good job yeah. of indoctrinating people with their brand. They can sit on the name. Yes. And Apple can do that right now. Yep. Um, and thankfully, they still make relatively good widgets. Mm-hmm. But there will be a time where it's like, I, I've heard Joe Rogan talking about the terrible keyboards on Apple recently. He's like, you know, when I write, I want to be able to feel the keys and, and, and like, I, I can't feel it. And so like, he's moved over to a windows computer for his writing just mm. because the, the key, and, and to me that is like n- avoiding the brand loyalty, but, but embracing the brands that make the best thing right now. Mm. Uh, so the craftsman is one example or, um, Ford versus Toyota or Chevy versus Toyota is probably a better example. Like Chevy's were the best cars yeah. in the seventies and then in the eighties. And then all of a sudden the nineties came along and it was like, what happened? Oh, this piece of junk is falling apart on the lot. And the sad part is, is like you still have people in the nineties 
no, it's still the best because they're st- yeah. still caught up in the brand. And then eventually people realize, like, well, no, this Toyota starts driving. I mean, mm. You and I both drive Toyotas now. Right. But it would be wrong of us to say, I'm going to drive Toyotas for the rest of my life. Yeah. No, because if Toyota starts making a crappy product, I don't want to have brand loyalty to it. That it just means making a bad decision. That's what, what brand loyalty ultimately is. So yeah. I'll read a little bit more of this, and we'll put a link to this essay in the show notes as well. This is why most companies dream about winning the loyalty of their customers. They needn't compete quite so hard with their rivals when they know you'll buy regardless of how their product measures up. Loyalty, while often considered to be a highly desirable trait, results in our ignoring better opportunities in favor of the ones that are more familiar. Instead of taking the road that's most favorable for us per- personally, loyalty instructs us to take the one that's most favorable for the company we're cur- uh, we currently work for. Instead of being the person we want to be with, uh, instead of being with the person we want to be with, loyalty compels us to stick with the person we once wanted to be with because they got there first. Mm. That's the way to think about this is just because someone got there first. So I can talk about a few brands that I currently get value from. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, the pants I'm wearing are Mission Workshop. Mm-hmm. The shirt I'm wearing is a Mission Workshop. Um, most of their stuff is made in America or Canada or, or some other place where you know there is not going to be any kind kind of uh, child labor, labor or unfair wage practices. Uh, as a result, you tend to pay more. But And just because you're paying more for something doesn't mean better quality either. Mm. In this case, you're paying more and you're getting good quality. Mm. However, if Mission Workshop next week, next month, next year, a decade from now, produce worse quality, it, I, I personally would find it less appealing yeah now just because mission workshop works for me and the size of my body i'm 6'2 145 pounds these same clothes aren't going to work well for you necessarily right right? now you own a pair of mission workshop pants or a different kind of pants or a bigger version of pants that i would wear Mm -hmm. and so you find value in them as well but not necessarily we both wear different brands of of t-shirts not because of, well, I have brand loyalty to one place or another. You're like, no, this one works better for me. Mm. Uh, some other brands that work well for me, uh, you and I, we share a Doxy scanner, right? Yeah. So a photo scanner, like that is a brand that has worked well for us. Mm. Uh, we did something called a scanning party. Sean, if you can put a link to the, the scanning party, it's an essay that we wrote in, in the show notes about scanning the excess stuff. I just did a living room conversation about what to do with old DVDs and old VHS tapes and old photos and old yearbooks. I, I did a uh, living room conversation on YouTube about that. And one of the, the answers is if you have a doxy scanner or there are other services you can use to scan these things. Um, our website is hosted by Bluehost. That is a hosting company that we use that I feel really good about. There are other just fine hosts out there and there are other free ways to do a blog as well. You know, mm. you can get on Tumblr and start a blog today. Blogspot, I'm sure, is still a thing. You could get out there and do it. There doesn't have to be barriers out there. And so it's something that we've used, but there are other alternatives. Just because it's something that, that you and I use doesn't mean it's the best thing that it, it's the thing that's best for you. Yeah. Right? I'm trying to think if there are any brands that I completely avoid because of the way that they treat the environment or or anything. There's not really Again, it goes to political stuff, like yeah. for the, like certain. Well, actually, like one of them is uh, it's a fast food restaurant, but I never eat there anyway. Uh-huh. <laughs> right, <laughs> but it would be the last food restaurant I ever eat at. It's like I avoid the thing I already avoided. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so I avoid that crack dealer. But are, are there any brands that you avoid that that you? that are irresponsible with whether it's the environment or whether it's yeah any anything that's fast anything that is fast fashion i avoid mm. uh for, for two reasons one is yeah. we, we throw away 88 pounds of clothes a year so um uh if i really wanted a shirt from h&m i'm sure i could find plenty of used shirts uh if I, for some reason i, I wanted uh, or a slashed one in the dumpster that well, you could repair that's the other problem is there a, i don't know if h&m does this specifically but there are are uh, other companies who um will 
uh, they had, there's 52 seasons a year for mm-hmm. uh, uh, Bex and I were walking past one of these fast, fast fast fashion stores the other day and she goes it's amazing every time we walk by the store the entire inventory of the store is different we've never been inside it mm. but every time we walk past like the entire inventory wow. is changed out once a week and what do they do with the old clothes they just cut them up and yeah, throw dude, them away it's a write off yeah. which is yeah, anyway yeah and, it's crazy in itself and so so we, we can't give them away because that's not a write off. Right. But if we slash them yeah. and throw them in a dumpster, right. then that's a write off. Yeah, and then we go and spit on homeless people after work. Right. Good that's grief. what it feels like. Yeah. Um so here's here's what I think about. I think about what you said early on. Consuming less. So so I I consume probably 90% less from what I did in my 20s. Maybe even more than 90%. Let's just call it 90%. Yeah. By consuming 90% less and focusing on companies that that I find value in, but also I know they are not... Um, killing puppies? Yes, they're not killing puppies. <laughs> um, and I, I, can, I can say, all right... Um, even if I uh, if I support a company like Apple, who may have may or may not have questionable practices in in the the building of their phones, mm-hmm. right? You look mm-hmm. at Foxconn and the documentaries that have been done yeah. on Foxconn. Um, and when I when I look at, at that, it's I'm also not going out and buying a new Apple phone every single year. I mean, back in our, our corporate days, I mean, you and I would go through three or four phones a year probably. Dude, yeah. remember that? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Sometimes one a month. Yeah, because we had access to, to them, right? And so, yeah. like, I would just consume, consume, consume. So, by radically reducing our consumption, the brands matter less. I'm not saying they don't matter, but I'm saying they matter less because we're the best way to affect change is to consume less, and ultimately that leads to having a better life because you're usually when you consume less, you're creating yeah. more as well. Well, dude, um, the. Uh, <laughs> the the american people specifically are marketed to the most out of any other people in the world mm. and we have uh our consumption habits as a nation uh you uh, you know on an average you and i probably fall below the average of, of consumption <laughs> we definitely fall way below the average <laughs> but but my point is is that you know, listening to two yokels talk about consuming less, uh-huh. it might sound crazy because of the habits that we have got into as a nation. Mm. Um, but, but you know, with with this American freedom we have, it comes as great responsibility for us to consume responsibly. Yeah, it doesn't mean don't consume. That that's not the message we want to put out there. Of course, it, it means that yes, we all need to consume some stuff, and that stuff is going to make our life better. Consuming better meals. You know, uh, when I had Dr. Tommy Wood on the podcast, we were talking about um, like if you if you have a cheat meal, what he's like, he's like, you know what? Every once in a while, I'll eat a piece of cake, but it better be a good piece of cake, as opposed to <laughs> remember when, when you and I were like fat kids, it was just like, well, what's the hostess cake? I'll grab from the shelf and eat. It was garbage. Man, I don't know why, but that just made me really want pizza. Because I haven't had pizza in so long. Especially with pineapple. I fucking love pineapple on pizza. <laughs> well, that's my point, though. Like, you, you probably... We just lost half our audience. <laughs> you, because I like pineapple on pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably don't want Little Caesars. You're not craving Little Caesars no, over... That's true. Like, if you were to go have a piece of pizza right now, you know, I'm going to run Little Caesars real quick, get the five for five special, or whatever the hell it is. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you're completing fast food places but yeah i'm with you <laughs> but it's all the same you put yes. it, you put arby's and, and and little caesar's in a blender and i handed you both in a cup you'd be like oh it's the same thing like, this is literally the same thing blend it up that's funny yeah so um what other brands do i like Jesus and marrow the brand is strong um I'm a big fan of, of Jesus and Marrow, but uh, they just left uh, Complex. Or not, yeah, they're on. No, they're on Viceland. Um, they're going to Showtime. It's mm. like my favorite TV show. But their tagline is "The brand is strong." Nice. Um, uh, just to finish out this this essay with uh, with Colin before we dive into the, the lightning round here. He says instead of focus on loyalty, I would suggest we approach both our product purchases and our relationships analytically. If we take the time to figure out what we want and what is best for us based on those wants the company selling to us may just realize they're selling to the wrong demographic or making the wrong product and the people we're with may realize that we're not ideal for them either 
This is not to say that we should all be opportunists moving from one shiny new thing to the next shiny new thing, regardless of the company or person in question. But it does mean that if properly thought through, a change in direction is not an ignoble act. In fact, such a shift could be the most beneficial thing for everyone involved. And here's a little update here at the end. Want to make a lot of people feel uncomfortable? Question the value of loyalty in their presence. This nobility of loyalty is so ingrained in most cultures that the very idea that it might not be a good thing can spark righteous anger or holy terror in some. Mm. I see that with some people who have brand loyalty where it's like, of course this is the best thing. Oh, yeah. And... Whether that is a Toyota evangelist, a Tesla evangelist, an Apple evangelist, I'm not going to evangelize no. for, for any product or service. I can tell you what I get value from when I talk about Mission Workshop or, or someplace like that. But uh, I also am not going to say, well, I stand behind this company no matter what. Yeah. Well, I think people, too, like they have preferences and they are their preferences that they really, really enjoy. Yes. So when someone else prefers something different, it makes it it, it can potentially make one feel less. Oh, that person doesn't prefer what I prefer, but I really prefer this, and here's why. Let me tell you why I prefer it. You need to prefer this too. Yeah. As opposed to questioning, why do I prefer? This? That's the thing that Colin said here. Is he said. Uh, Take time to figure out what you really want. Mm. And then you find the brands that will serve that want. Recently on, on the website, we put out that the, the comparison, the list of, of essential items, non-essential items, and junk. We all know what the essentials are. Mm-hmm. We need to figure out what the non-essentials are. Those are the things that we want, the things that truly add value to our lives. The problem where we really get caught up is we mistake all this extra junk, other people's preferences, Mm. other people's added values. Mm -hmm. We say, oh, but that's going to add value to my life too. Yeah. But it may not. And so what do you want? And then what are the things that are appropriate for that life? Speaking of Colin, Ryan, did you know that he is, do you know what he's doing over the next year? Um, have you have you seen this, dude? I have, but I it, I'm totally I know it has to do something with traveling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so our friend Colin I know it has something to do with time traveling. <laughs> yes, he's figured it out finally. <laughs> um, he's figured out how, how to uh, how to travel 24 hours in one day. Oh my god. <laughs> no, he um. So our friend Colin Wright, he is the person who introduced us to minimalism. A uh, decade ago now, holy mm, moly. Yeah, man. Uh, a decade ago, he introduced us to the concept of minimalism. Dude, I guess more it was, than that. It, so was not, it was nine years ago. Yeah. More than that? No, it was 2009. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whoops, yeah. yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah, so yeah. so he he introduced us to the idea of minimalism, and then we fell down the rabbit hole and were introduced to a bunch of other minimalists. And when we first discovered him, you know, Colin was traveling to a new country every four months, and he didn't pick the country. It was based on where his readers sent him, basically. They all voted on his website. And so he, at the time, was like in Argentina and Iceland and India and, and um, I don't know, a bunch of other countries. Romania. That, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so he was going to different countries every four months based on the votes of his readers. And then he did, um, the last couple of years, he said, okay, I want to try to have a home base for a while. So he let his readers vote on the state he was going to stay in. So they voted on... Uh, I think they just like voting on places that make him uncomfortable. Right. So when he would move to a place, he would want to live there like a local. So he wouldn't like get an Airbnb or you know, live in a hotel for four months. He would read the first two paragraphs on Wikipedia and then just show up in the country and have to find a way to rent an apartment or, or whatever. And so when he came back to the States, um, well, the first time he came back, he lived with us for seven months in Missoula, Montana, when we started Asymmetrical Press, our, our publishing company. And then he did more traveling and then came back to the States Mm -hmm. and said, okay, I'm going to live in a city for a year. I'm going to have a home base so I can focus on, on my podcast. His podcast is called let's know things and focus on more video stuff on his YouTube channel. And so they voted on Kansas. And so he picked Wichita. Right. And he and I had a conversation about, he learned a whole lot from living in a sort of very conservative, conservative state. And that's where the Koch brothers, uh, the city is basically named after the Koch brothers. It could be, Coke Brothers, Kansas instead of Wichita. Um, 
And after that, they voted on Tennessee. And so he's lived in Memphis for the last year. And that his his one-year lease is almost up there. So he's learned a lot. He's cooked for himself every meal for the last... Like he's become a good chef, basically. Not a chef, but a good cook. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's cooked all his own meals. And now for the next year, he's going. He, he has bought an RV, like an 80s RV. Nice. And uh, I do remember this now. He's simplifying his life once again. He's moving from like 700 square feet to 200 square feet. He's going to live in this RV for the next year, and he's going to travel around all of North America. He's going to go on a year-long tour. Yes. And so he's going to 26 cities for two weeks at a time, and he's going to have an event in each city. Nice. And I was thinking about Leslie. Her, her, she's from Denver, so I reached out to to Colin. Leslie, I'm going to give you two tickets. Well, Colin's really going to give you two tickets to his. <laughs> his he's going to do a, a tour stop. Now, a lot of these are free or really inexpensive to go to because he's going to do. He's going. To, I think he's doing two events in each city. He's going to do like a, a a live podcast where he sort of fleshes out these ideas. So his podcast, which is called Let's Know Things, mm-hmm. he tries to learn things out loud in front of an audience. So it's like Let's Know Things to get Let's Learn Things together, basically. So he's going to do a, this event where he learns things in front of people, but then he's also going to do a a sort of book tour uh, stop it's called the becoming tour and um so he wrote a book uh recently uh, about <laughs> becoming who we, the person who we want to be right and so he is going to spend the next 26 weeks going to tw- i'm sorry 52 weeks going to 26 different cities and uh and doing like living in the city locally for two weeks in his this rv the becoming tour so yeah. many innuendo is not enough time <laughs> yes <laughs> well um it's really about becoming the person you want to become and yeah. and that and and what he's talking about is how that changes over time how it's ever evolving like the person you want to be become you you'll become that person but then who do you want to become after that right yeah. and at least that, that's how i'm interpreting it so uh I, i'm probably gonna go i'm definitely gonna crash his la stop that he's gonna have uh, I might go to his Salt Lake stop and maybe his Jacksonville stop as well. Uh, and maybe if I can convince Ryan, drag him along, we'll uh, we'll show up together. I'd be, and, yeah, I would love yeah. to. Just because uh, the Jacksonville one, I think, is in December. So I was hoping to. When does it start? Uh, it starts, I believe, in September, uh, August or September. Okay. So it's right around the corner. Cool. Um, it's either the next month or within the next couple months. And so. And is that the only stop he's doing in Florida? It's uh, yeah, I think he's just doing Jacksonville in Florida. So if, if we're down in in, in uh, St. Pete for our coffee shop, then we, we can plan a trip around that. Maybe just take a, a drive over. Yeah, that'd be great. And crash a few of his stops. And who knows? We may, we may crash a few others. I can't promise you anything. But if you show up to one of Colin's uh, either free or inexpensive tour stops, then who knows? We may we may show up as a special guest. You can find all the details to that over at becomingtour.com. We don't get anything for telling you that. We just really, really like Colin and uh, hope you give him a shot. You can also check out his podcast. It's called Let's Know Things. All right, Ryan, uh, we'd love to hear what you all have to say. So if you have a comment or a tip about buying things, especially buying things deliberately, then uh, give us a call, 406-219-7839. If you have a comment or a tip, you can also send a voice memo right from your phone to podcast at theminimalists.com. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on a future episode. And stay tuned to the end of this episode for this week's listener comments and tips. And oh, by the way, we're also looking for questions about sex, and love, and business, and jobs, and sleep. Those are five different topics. Sex, love, business, jobs, and sleep for five different future episodes. So if you call up with a question about those, you're much more, you can call with a question about whatever, but you're much more likely to get your question aired if you call up with a question about sex, or love, or sleep, or jobs, or business. All right, Ryan, what time is it? It's time for our lightning round, where we answer questions from social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at The Minimalists, during the lightning round. This is where Ryan and I each do our best to answer every question with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We also put the text of these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media, if you'd like. And now you can find all of our quotes in one place, all of our pithy answers over at minimalmaxims.com. All right, our first lightning round question is from Nick. Would you rather spend more money on a better product or spend less money on a product you might need to replace later on? Well, my, my pithy answer is this. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit, Ryan. More isn't better. Only better is better. And so sometimes more is better. Uh, I'm thinking about one of the things we're going to talk about. We could talk about it now because I have several. More donations to this food co-op is better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sometimes more is better for sure. Yes. Sometimes more sex is better. 
sometimes more sex is too much right um and, and so uh <laughs> i've been on both ends of that spectrum <laughs> that's <laughs> comment redacted <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I'm thinking. So one of my, my added values later on is uh, Drake's new album, which is called Scorpion. Drizzy. <laughs> yeah, he's got 25 songs on it, and that's been the big complaint from everyone. But for me, it's like, okay, I don't like all 25 songs on this album, but I'm really glad he put 25 songs on here because I think the songs that people really like, the singles, are the ones I don't like. Mm. And so I can kind of make my own version. Like I can make a great 15 song version of Scorpion that is like masterpiece level good mm -hmm. in this case it was one of those rarities where more was better in this case mm. now now i think what what nick is saying here is something different like hey should i spend more money on this thing if i can't afford it well what do you mean by afford it so so if you can't afford it spending more uh, uh uh more money is probably the wrong thing but if you can afford it then spending more today will often save you money in the long run right mm. ryan so if, yeah. if you if if the the pair of pants cost you a hundred dollars but they're going to last you for two years it's better than buying 10 pairs of ten dollar pants that are going to last you one month each and by the way you don't even like them anyway right yeah no i, I think about uh i learned that with my my uh like shaver i bought a while ago uh -huh. like just a trimmer yeah because they got like you know eight dollar trimmers i always get the eight dollar trimmer yeah and replace it three months later right yeah it was so it ends up costing you more when you do that right, right. so uh I, I have this really short blog post from seth godin that, that his question reminded me of it's called the shortcut crowd he said there is no market there are markets and markets have segments there are people who enjoy buying expensive wine there are people who will save up their money to have a big wedding there are people who pay to have a personal trainer and with within segments there are careful consumers traditional consumers consumers who seek out the cutting edge there are bargain hunters luxury snobs and people who measure the way consumer reports does often overlooked though is the fact that in many markets particularly involving personal finance small business and relationships there are people who are obsessed with the shortcut they want something that's too good to be true. They respond to big promises that offer magical, nearly instant results. They want a, sque uh, they want a squeeze page, a tripwire offer, a hard sell. They respond to these messages because they're a signal that a shortcut is on offer. My grandmother, this is the part that really stood out to me, Ryan, because I bought a uh, exercise bike recently. Um, my gra and I'll explain why in a moment. It actually saved me money, so we'll get to that. Uh, my grandmother, who never exercised a day in her life, bought an exercise machine from a late-night TV commercial. When it sat gathering dust, she explained that she thought it would do the exercise for her and was disappointed that it didn't magically make her fit for $99. So uh, it goes on. We'll put a link to that because it's a, it's a longer essay than that. I don't want to read the whole thing. But the part that stood out to me there, Ryan, was like, yeah, just buying the thing doesn't mean it's going to improve your life. Bex and I have been uh, for about two months considering buying an exercise bike. And it's, right. a, it's an expensive purchase. But we've been spending a decent amount of money at SoulCycle and not even going every single day, like going mm. once a week or sometimes at max twice a week. And that, that starts to add up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And also... I don't have the convenience of being able to do it in, in my own house. And by the way, soul cycle class is usually an hour long and I, in, you pack half an hour on each side to you know get there and shower and everything else and all of a sudden it's two two and a half hour commitment to the, doing this exercise class that becomes a barrier for me it was like okay what if i want to do 20 or 30 minutes of cardio mm -hmm. um this is a great way for me to for me to do that and so being able to justify we're actually going to spend less money over the long run even though i'm going to have to spend or i had to spend a, a Bex and I had to spend a good chunk of money right now in order to buy an exercise bike. And you didn't just buy a $99 late night commercial exercise bike. I, I am hoping it does the exercises <laughs> for me, though. That'd be great. <laughs> That's why you paid more money for <laughs> That's it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my short answer. Wait, is by that, the way, remember those like those infomercials where, like <laughs> they had the electric shocks you put on your abs that were gonna work your abs while you're watching TV. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Too good to be true. Yes, indeed. 
Uh, my short answer is this. Forsaking your budget is more harmful than forsaking quality. So, yeah, of course, if you can afford a quality item, get the quality item. But if you got to go into debt to get the quality item, that is the wrong reason to get the quality item. Yeah. Uh, a good example is like this pair of pants I'm wearing. Um, it was, they were like a hundred bucks yeah. and someone came to like, man, I really like those pants. Did you put uh, them on your diner's club w- card? W- yes, I did. W- uh, what's the brand? Um, you know, where can I get them? And I told them and then they shot me a, a text and they're like, you know, I, I looked them up. It's a little bit outside of my budget. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, do, you know, are there any other sports brands that you would recommend that maybe would have a cheaper option? So forth and so on. Right. Uh, yes. Like this is. This is the pair of pants I really like. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel good in them. Uh, they're comfortable. They're great. I can afford them. I don't have to put them up, put them on my Diners Club card. <sighs> uh, and my friend, who would have to put it on a Diners Club card, they quickly realized, like, oh, yeah, these are a good pair of pants, but I'm not going to go out of my way just to get a pair of pants that Ryan has because Ryan has them, uh, and I'm certainly not going to go into debt to get those pair of pants. I think that is the question that we need to be asking Nick. It's not about... Uh, you know, always buying the better quality item. You've got to have room for it in your budget. And the other thing too is like, how much is it going to cost you outside of, uh, like you said, outside of the money? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, do you have, do you have time to take care of it? Do you have time to appreciate it? Do you have time to, to change the oil in the thing, whatever it may be, there are a lot of costs to consider, but just to sit there and look at quality versus quantity, quantity. Yes, that's an important factor, but I think there are a lot of other things we need to consider before, uh, making a purchase just over you know quality versus quantity. Yeah, we, we brought we bought some uh, plants for our apartment recently, and uh, I made sure they were ones I didn't have to water that frequently. Right, and, and, and you know one of one of them is a cactus. Right, <laughs> you never our, have to water it. Yeah, I mean we water it occasionally, but like you barely have to water. And and that was a factor because like that's part of the extra cost. It's like okay, this plant does cost a certain amount of money, but what is I there's I have to have the space for it. That's a cost, mm-hmm. but um, I also have to water it. Do I have to water it daily, weekly, monthly? And and that's a, and now it's like taking up this psychological space as well. Thankfully, Bex handles it, and she has a calendar entry for it, and she knows when to water these things. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure they would just die very quickly. Somehow, I'd find a way to kill a cactus. <laughs> You'd put it in a dark corner and watch <laughs> we, it wither. We went to go buy it, and I'm like, yeah, I really want to put it in this corner where we have that other plant. That you have a very similar plant to what, I had what we have. The same exact plant. <laughs> you just borrow every other day. Yes. Uh, and, and I was wanting to put the cactus there and and he's like well is there direct sunlight i'm like no nah, it's you know it's a uh, we have a for those of you who have watched the living room conversations you know we have a pretty l- light apartment but there isn't like the di- just direct sunlight there all day and he just looks at me he goes well cactuses live in the desert and there are no dark deserts <laughs> and uh, yeah that's true what's our next question our next question is from Susan. Actually, what you were talking about is a really good lead into this question what criteria do you meet before committing to a purchase. Well, see, my, my, my pithy answer is really lame, but I thought it was funny enough. So it's like, the remember the Johnny Cochran line? If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Yes. I mean, I had to work on this one for a while. It's so lame. Like, this is my lamest minimal maximum. <laughs> oh, uh, talk about <laughs> quality versus quantity. <laughs> well, no, it's just like, it's lame because it's cheesy. Yeah, right? it is super cheesy. So if it doesn't fit, you must deep six. Yeah, so let's just talk about this. Uh, no, it's good, man. So, so there's good. some questions that I ask myself. The uh, idea behind it, I totally get it, man. It's great. So if I were to rephrase Susan's question, what criteria do you meet before committing to a purchase? You know, what questions do you ask before uh, making a purchase? So number one, can I afford it? So can I afford its actual cost, right? The watering, the, the, the plants. Yeah, okay, can I afford the actual monetary cost? Do I have the money in my bank account? If I have to go into debt for it, I can't afford it. If I don't have the space for it, I can't afford it. If I have to buy something extra for this thing, I probably can't afford it, right? Mm-hmm. So what is the actual cost of the thing and can I afford that actual cost? Number two, will it add value to my life? What do I mean by that? Does it serve a purpose or do does it bring me joy? Or ideally both, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, the 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 plants are a good example. They they bring joy. They serve as a decoration. They don't have an actual function, but the purpose is they look good. Now, indoor plants they actually help filter the air as well, so it does serve an additional purpose there. So, does it add value to my life? Does it serve a purpose? Does it bring me joy? Number three, what are the alternatives to this thing? Sometimes I think we don't ask this question enough. Like, well, yes, I can afford the thing. I got the money in my checking account, right? Mm-hmm. 
And then, yeah, I think this thing will serve a purpose. If I buy another pair of pants, it would serve a purpose, right? But then what's the alternative? What can I do with that extra $100? Mm. What's the alternative? What else can I do with this money? What's your what's your uh, uh, opportunity cost? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what you're looking at. Yeah, that, that, the, the economic economic term, term is opportunity cost. So, so what else can I do with this money? Right. And then the fourth thing that I ask myself, I'm, if I'm absolutely certain. So the, the exercise bike that we recently purchased would fall into this. So and I'm writing something about this uh, coming up. So can I wait 30 hours if it's more than $30 or 30 days if it's greater than $100? I know I wrote down $20, but it's actually 30 because it's the 30-30 rule, mm. this new rule that I'm working on here. So can I wait 30 hours? So it's basically, is a day or more? Like, can I at least wait a day? 30 hours if it's more than $30. Can I wait a day? Now, there'll be some cases where I can't wait a day, right? Because I really need this widget or whatever yeah. that it costs 35 bucks. <clears throat> now, if it's more than $100, can I wait at least 30 days on it again the exercise bike was it was a great example because it's certainly more than a hundred dollars and we waited well over 30 days deliberating over this decision and eventually we decided to pull the trigger and 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 and, and get it but it was out and i could feel better about the purchase because i know that it's not a it wasn't an impulse buy absolutely it was absolutely deliberate dude i feel that way about my coffee grinder like i have had a manual grinder for the last four years yeah and a couple months ago um I just I was reading this thing where basically an electric grinder is better than a hand grinder, and I just didn't realize that. And uh, I really like having and making the best cup of coffee I can in the morning. Right. Get a lot of joy out of it. Yeah. So I finally went out and I got a grinder. The reason why I had avoided this purchase for so long because like a good electric grinder is over a hundred bucks. Yes. So I went and spent uh, it's like 120, 130 bucks on this grinder. Mm-hmm. Dude, it I is. Got, I just got the grinder app and. It, I mean, it does something different, but like, <laughs> you find you find some muscular man to grind your coffee for you. <laughs> yeah, is that a euphemism? You're gonna love it, <laughs> dude. I cannot tell you the amount of difference. Like, I have, I felt like I was like, shit, man. Like, I have been like depriving myself ah. of this, not just a convenience. But it does it does produce a better grind, which produces a better cup of coffee. Mm. Do you know the brand? Maybe we can talk about that during um, the added value. I don't, but I can certainly. Uh, we'll talk about I, it next week. Talk about it next week. Sure, yeah. sounds good, man. I will. Yes, we'll, we'll we'll put a pin in that. All right, here's my short answer for you, Susan. A few things to consider before making a purchase: budget, occupied space, and hidden costs. Uh, I think the la- the 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 last one there, hidden costs. That's something that I used to forsake uh, a lot. Mm. Like um, I'd buy a really nice pair of like Allen Edmonds shoes. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, which are still made in America somehow. Yes, and they're they're great. It's a great shoe company. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but you know, polishing them up as often as I had to polish them up didn't really consider that when I bought that 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 pair of shoes. Right. Um, there are just certain hidden costs that that if we if we buy an impulse, uh, we will miss those hidden costs mm. and we'll regret it later. So a few things for you to consider there, Susan. Remember, remember, Susan. If it doesn't fit, you must deep six. <laughs> All right. P.S. See what I did there, Ryan? P.S. We have one more question. Oh, man. A breathing. <laughs> P.S. We have one more question. Laura says, uh, Laura asks, how do I fight the paradox of choice at the grocery store? Now, she's specifically talking about Whole Foods here, and you and I often talk about Whole Foods, but I think this applies to any large store, just any any store in general. And Ryan and I, you and I are going to have a conversation about that, and if you all want to hear our answer to that question, then you can listen to this week's Postscript episode, P.S., over at the Minimalist Private Podcast, available exclusively to our Patreon supporters. That's why it is a private podcast. So if you want to support this show and help keep this podcast 100% advertisement free, then head on over to theminimalists.com slash support. In addition to our weekly postscript episodes, the Minimalist private podcast feed includes our monthly Ask the Minimalists Anything episodes. We've had 11 of those so far, Ryan. Actually, 12 if you count the, the part one and two that we did for, of number 10. Remember that? Oh, yeah. We had the mess up, but we, were, we had the audio for both of them. So I guess technically we have 12 Ask the Minimalist Anything episodes, which you can find all of those over at the private podcast feed. Also, unreleased recordings of our live events. We just put up the first Melbourne event that we did uh, earlier this year. Uh, the Sydney events up there, the Tampa event, the Detroit event. Dude, that first Melbourne event, that's my favorite event ever. <laughs> it was so good, man. Dude, it is like by far my favorite event ever. Especially the part where we were talking about hand jobs. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't talking about hand jobs. That's actually, tr- well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Anyway, um, 
I lost my place in the script here. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. The entire back catalog of past private episodes. If you become a supporter, you get all the the back catalog. We've we've done over sixty episodes now, Ryan, of the Minimalists Private Podcast. And once you become a supporter, you'll receive a personal link to our private podcast feed so that it plays in your normal podcast player. So whatever podcast player you're using to to listen to this right now. And as a Patreon supporter, you also receive access to our monthly live stream videos. We just did uh, number 11 on that, as well as first access to tickets to all of our live events before those tickets are available to the general public. Find all the details and all the good stuff over at theminimalists.com slash support. And here is a snippet from this week's Postscript episode. The paradox of choice uh, for people who are uninformed about what the paradox of choice basically like it's the reason that uh, we're all actually turned off by the paradox of choice. Paradox of choice means we have so many options that we end up not making a decision at all. Right. Grocers and other places actually don't want the, you to have the paradox of choice, and that's why they create these. I remember when we worked for the telecom company that we worked for for over a decade. Um, we had good, better, best plans. That's what you want to present to people. You want to present people, here are your three options. People like options. People hate too many options, right? Mm. It's like when you go somewhere and you feel overwhelmed, it, you feel overwhelmed because there are too many options. And so places try to help you make the choice for you. So how do I deal with the the good, better, best uh, thing? I create my own good, better, best if there's a paradox of choice, right? Mm. And so if there are so many options, I'll say, okay, I'm going to pick three. And then w- what are the three that I would ideal choose like what what i'm gonna be happy with any of these three choices okay and then which one is the most ideal right now now most ideal might mean most ideal because of price most ideal because of taste most ideal because of my current need Mm. uh most ideal because of the time of day the chocolate bar that i want right now here are the three options well i want one with no sugar i'm gonna buy the 100 percent, right and so there's my good better best as opposed to the 400 chocolate bars they have what are the three i know are good options here's my good better best pick one of those three i know I'm going to be happy no matter what. All right, and we're back, Ryan. It's time for our added value portion of the show. This is where we each talk about something that has added value to our lives recently. So I I already alluded to this, but the new Drake album, it's called Scorpion. Now, two things. It came out on my birthday. Happy birthday from Drake. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And... And one of my favorite songs on there, it's a song called Elevate. It's a, uh, a song about sort of, I can't believe this happened to me. Like, I couldn't have imagined all these good things happening to me. And one of the lines in there, when I was making the road trips from Cincinnati up to Dayton. Mm. And I, I just, I had this flight because every day I How drove, does he know, how, how does he have experience with that? I must have been doing tours, like, you know, like uh, doing a, a show in, in Cincinnati. And he talks yeah. about refueling and having to drive from Cincinnati up to Dayton. And every day I was, when I was doing the director job, I would drive because I lived downtown Dayton because I didn't want to live in Cincinnati. Nothing against Cincinnati. I just love Dayton. And so... Uh, I was making that drive, that 54-mile drive from downtown Cincinnati to downtown Dayton every single day. And he has this line. It comes out on my birthday. 25 songs. He did an A-side and a B-side. The A-side is like rapping Drake, and the B-side is singing R&B Drake. And um, I, I've listened. It's 25 songs. I've listened to it several times. He talks about you know, he had a, a kid, and he had that whole sort of – beef with Pusha T. And <laughs> it's funny was, how he addresses that. Yeah, yeah. and he, he had this sort of, he had this great line, right? He said, because uh, Pusha T called him out like, you're you're hiding a, a child. Yeah. And he said, I wasn't hiding my son from the world. I was hiding the world from my son. Yeah. And like, like, and he has other lines about our addiction to social media on there. And uh, there are just some great one-liners, some great lyrics. And like I said... Dude, people, a lot of people, it's funny because the love people use things, the opposite never works. Right, right, right. I mean, there are a ton of different variations of that quote. Yeah. Well, the first, the first person who said it was was the venerable uh, Bishop Fulton, yeah, ni- I, 1925. Yeah, I didn't know that when I was first inspired by that, by okay. that quote. But what people don't know is that Drake is the one that it actually inspired that quote for us. Yeah. And he yeah. was inspired from the last person who was inspired from the last person who was inspired from the dude that you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. But so, it's funny though, like Drake, he does uh, he does have this like awesome 
way of like say, like rapping about some philosophical stuff oh he has these, these like little turn of phrases right yeah. the, the the you know i wasn't hiding my child from the world I was hiding the world from my child and and, and and you know what he means by that right like of course i want to i want to sh- protect my son from the nonsense now the, the weird thing about this album is people are, are criticizing because they're saying it's so bloated um the thing I really liked about the album, though, is in the editor's note, you know, the, the album description, basically, like if you pull it up on Spotify or Apple Music or something, it has all the criticisms of Drake. Like, That's he, awesome. He basically says, yeah, uh, Drake doesn't rap enough. Drake sings too much. Drake <laughs> thinks he's Jamaican. Drake took an L. Like, like all of these, like, the, these criticisms... Um, that he just addresses immediately like in in before you even listen to the album it's in the the sort of liner notes of of the album and people are complaining that it's a, a bloated thing but for me what's nice is because it's all digital now you just remove the songs that you don't want to hear like yeah. i'm not a big fan of the singles i'm usually not a fan of drake singles um but i get that a lot of people are those are his most popular songs for a reason yeah so it, to me there are those people bitching and complaining too like they're still listening to the album that's what cracks me up yeah and, and they're saying like well he, he gave us too many songs then get rid of the 10 songs you dislike you have the ability to delete songs in your library yes and you can li- listen and you can love the 15 songs you, that you that you really yeah, enjoy curate the songs that you really really love and make yeah. it your own album yeah and, and and then it's like when people complain about our podcast being too long sometimes turn the thing off right make it a two-parter yeah it's two <laughs> minutes if you press pause right two minutes in yes yes indeed so uh the new drake album is called scorpion um let's see oh this journal this new journal i'm using we talked about journals a couple weeks ago in one of our podcasts uh which episode was that uh, anyway um he sent this to me and there- so he when he says he's talking about uh drew Kapner? Yeah. Am I saying his name right? Uh, Kapner, yeah. Kapner. Yeah. I will <laughs> that guy. Yeah. The so, guy who did our soundtrack for Minimalism. <laughs> yeah, he's... Uh, did you see that dance video that girl did? No. Dude, she did this whole... Um, uh, I, I don't know if it's interpretive dance, but it's like a modern style dance to one of the songs off our documentary. Look at it. She tweeted you yesterday or the day before. Okay. Look it up when you get a chance. It's really, really good. I'll check it out. So, so uh, Drew, actually, we'll put that we'll put that in our show notes. What the link to her dance? The link video? to her dance video. That's great. It's pretty good. So Drew and Nate formed a band. Uh, Nate, Nate, Nate Pfeiffer. He's from Utah, and uh, Drew is the lead singer of possibly my favorite band of all time. Um, a band called Parlor Hawk. Now they have only two albums. Will probably only ever have two albums. Their second album to me is a perfect album. It's great. Uh, it's uh, it's self titled Parlor Hawk. But um, we begged him for a while to make a a uh, soundtrack. Him and Nate partnered up. They made a band called We V V E, and they capital did, V capital V E. Yeah, yeah. capital E. Yeah. yeah, and so they did the minimalism soundtrack, which you can find wherever you listen to music. Um, they they put it out on all the the streaming platforms. But we got him to do it. We ba- basically just paid for studio time. We were really grateful for they, they decided to do that. But he's a product designer. He makes things intentionally. He runs a company called Everyman. And uh, they just started this Kickstarter. So if you're looking for a new journal, the thing that I like about this, because I usually use those just moleskins. Now here's here's what I, I this is a uh, practice of me letting go. And and uh, podcast Sean and I had an argument over this the other day. It wasn't a real argument, but like I just throw out like my journal as soon as I'm done with it. Like I don't want to keep like it's because it, it's hard for me to let go of it, mm, right? Because yeah. oh, it's all those things I wrote in there. Nope, for me, I get rid of it. Now, this this is a beautiful journal. I'm not saying you need a new journal. You probably don't need a new journal, so don't get it if you don't. Um, oh, smell that, man. It's I mean, it smells like you want to write it smells something. smells like leather. Yes, it does. And, and so um, it's the nice thing about it is see these little screws here on the side? Yeah. This part comes out. So if you want to like, and it's a nice inside sort of notebook you can and they look great on a shelf if you want to have you know, people are like i could never get rid of all my journals then freaking keep your journals i don't care what you do with your old journals right, right. have a shelf of journals these actually look good on a shelf you can see their their kickstarter video um so he sent this to me and i just started using it for the notes on this episode i i, I so, so i don't carry around a large notebook all the time i like the size of this better than my mm. big moleskin it's the appropriate size for me it fits in my bag really well it's nice to have at my desk just having something to to write on at my desk is is really nice and so this is replacing my my moleskin and i like the pages are also perforated so you can you can tear them out to tear pages out of moleskins well so, ruin the moleskin yeah sometimes. some of them they do have perforated i think 
I think some of them do have perforated edges, but yeah, for all intents and purposes, the ones that don't, yes, yeah. it will ruin the whole moleskin. Although I'm an idiot and I started writing on the wrong side, so the actual beginning is up here, and I screwed it up. Oh, anyway, that's funny. So yeah, now I'm I'm writing on both sides, but um, I've really enjoyed it so far. That said, I once I'll, I'll pull this out, and this will get better with age, right? Mm. So this 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 cover as i continue putting new notebooks in it will weather really well they had a couple different colors you know i went with the black because my soul is black (laughs) (laughs) um no i i i just you know aesthetically but they had some other ones that were like tan leather and um it just looked really good they're doing a kickstarter for it we'll put a link to that kickstarter in the show notes again you you probably we talk about buying things with intention if you need a new journal and you want something that's going to last a a lifetime and you do journaling and you want a good like desk notebook i think it's a a good way to to support a brand or really a couple guys who are behind a, a brand who do everything that they do with intention so uh it is called the endeavor notebook by the way and uh, yeah, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. One last, oh, two last things, I guess. Um, our friend Carl from Minimalism.life, our little side project. Yeah. He put, he put out an extra side project. <clears throat> How did he make it? Well, because he's a designer, but <laughs> yeah, he made a website way prettier than ours. <laughs> no, that's what he does. <laughs> he, so it, it's called Minimal List. Minimal List. Now, it is spelled M. N M L L dot I S T. So it's like minimal without the vowels, only the consonants with an L at the end dot I S T. Minimal list. Anyway, uh, we'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. He described it perfectly, Ryan. So I went on there, I was looking at these different things that are on there. It's an ever evolving directory of all things minimal based on categories and subcategories. Think of it as the ultimate bookmark for minimalist. Dude, I was checking out the website and I love how it is really simple. Yeah. Um, and you can just kind of pick a topic, mm-hmm. but then like you can dive mm-hmm. so deep. Yes. And he does such a good job of like not making you feel overwhelmed. Right. And because you, you, you get go- to choose, you get to choose what you're overwhelming yourself with. <laughs> right. As opposed to just like hitting you over the head with like, there's clearly no pop ups or there's, there's no, I mean, right. there's nothing like it. It's, it's aggressively simple, but it has categories like if I ever were to buy a bike, I meaning if I ever learned how to ride a bike and, and then I bought one, like I would clearly go on and he has like the three bikes that he finds to be most beautiful. And then, um, uh, books, you know, he has books about minimalism, like goodbye things or everything mm. that remains or, um, uh, the more of less by Joshua Becker, but then you can dive deeper into like the subcategory. But you got the top three in all these different categories of tables, like dining room tables, and, and different things. That it's a really well curated list. If you're thinking about buying something and you want to do so with intention, he has curated this this list, and that's why it's called the Minimal List. M I M N M L L dot I S T. And then I want to talk to you about this, Ryan. You and I had movie night. We're we're starting to watch the Matrix trilogy, dude. I cannot believe how well the Matrix held up. I know. What year did that come? It was like 90... 98 or 99, I believe. I think it was 99. Well, here. It's going to be right here. 1999. 1999. Yeah. Dude, for that film almost being 20 years old... Yes. Like, it just... It holds up incredibly well. Yeah. You and I were talking about, like... I think a lot of it has to do with the the green screen. I think a lot of it was done with the green screens as opposed to, like, CGI, which I think CGI for 20 years ago would have made it look pretty bad. But, um, man, and I think the reason it holds up so well is not because of the, the wonderful sort of aesthetics of the... Um... Yeah, of the of the cinematography or right, you which go. is good. but yeah. the, the the writing in it is, is really yeah. good. Of course, the acting is good. I mean, Lawrence Fishburne is top five actors of all time, probably. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, so I have some of the quotes here. Now, the reason I printed out some of these quotes, Ryan, is I think a lot of the quotes from this movie, the, the memorable ones, are so overused, and they're so like, well, red pill, blue pill, and they've they, they've taken on totally different meanings now, right? Yeah. But there are other sort of quotes from here that we don't remember that are perfect metaphors for our consumer culture back then and today because it's not so appreciably different and so there are a few of them in here let's Um, talk about them yeah so agent smith when he said i'd like to share a revelation that i've had during my time here it came to me when i tried to classify your species humans and i realized that you're not actually mammals every mammal on this planet instinctly develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment but you humans do not 
you move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed and only and the only way you can survive is to spread to another area is there another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern do you know what it is a virus human beings are a disease a cancer on this planet you're a plague and we are the cure. God, I just want to see the second Matrix now. <laughs> well, we're going to hopefully next week. <laughs> but but the I I don't agree with that in terms of humans. But no. but it's human behavior quite often, right? Yeah. It's it's this. Uh, if we allow our impulses to run us, right? I mean, at its at its terminus, like yes, that is absolutely true. It's it's consumerism is the virus, yeah. right? And so what I look at it as like it, it, there aren't there aren't other mammals or animals that that are consumers the way that we are except i mean uh, the analogy that chris delia always talks about is barracudas right calls people kudos because like barracudas they jump and bite at shiny things Mm -hmm. like as soon as they see the shiny objects and and we often do the same thing with consumerism we're just biting at the the next shiny thing i'll find a couple other quotes here these are from my idm imdb um what are you what are you trying to tell me i can dodge bullets no, Neo. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. <laughs> so good. Dude. Yes. I got chills just listening to that line. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, dude, like, I cannot believe how much I enjoyed that movie watching it for the 20th time. Yes. I just haven't seen it in probably five years. Well, and, and it sort of reminds me of, like, when when these, when these people ask, like, like um, do you, you know, is it easier for you to, to, like, not buy stuff now? I mean, the honest answer is, yeah. But it's because I'm not always thinking about buying the stuff anymore. It's like right. when I become a minimalist, uh, well, I buy fewer things. And then the answer would be like, when you become a minimalist, you won't have to. Yeah. Like, w- because you're focused on what is actually more important in your life. That's really what minimalism is about. It's the intentional uh, that's so, uh, curation. That's, good, that's, yeah, that's so, a good spin on it. So, so I, that's what, when, as soon as I heard that, that's what I thought about. What, Go oh, ahead. I was going to say one of my favorite lines is when like they just got him out of the little you know, embryo looking thing. Yes. And he's like, why do my eyes hurt? Yeah. And he's like, yes. it's because you've never used them. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, damn, like yeah. that is such a good metaphor for like what, for minimalism. When we take this on, yeah. it hurts, man. There's yeah. a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, uh, uh, difficulty letting things go. Yeah. There's a lot of difficulty with changing habits. Yes. And it's because we've never looked at life that way before. Like, yes, there is this painful, uh, uh, kind of beginning that comes with minimalism, right? But yeah, once we get used to it, yeah, you won't even have to buy things, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think that's actually that's that's not true. You will still have to buy some stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but you won't be worried about it, right? And yeah. I, th- I think that's the thing because you, if you develop the habits and the rules that are appropriate for you, then you stop worrying about like I don't worry about buying things anymore, right? Mm. It's because I know that I'm deliberate with the things I bring into my life. I'm also deliberate with the things that I choose to hold on to. Yeah. And uh, the 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 eyes thing is a much better metaphor than the red pill blue. The red pill blue pill thing has just become so overused. Like, yes, okay, minimalism is the red pill. It opens up the 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 truth or whatever. Fine, whatever. You you can say that if you want. But the better metaphor is like, open your eyes. Mm. And, and and right now we're walking around with our eyes closed, so to speak. Because yeah, well, I think I'm sorry. You go finish ahead. the metaphor. No, go ahead. What, what I was thinking is like our eyes closed is living off of impulse. Exactly. That's that's what living off of impulse is. And it that is, brings me that brings me to the next quote. It's yeah. from remember Mouse when he he designed the, the 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 woman in the red dress. Oh yeah yeah. And I disagree with this quote because I think it's the the opposite is true. Mouse said uh, to deny our own impulses is to deny the very thing that makes us human. And I would say the very thing that makes us human is our ability to deny our acting on every impulse. The yeah. ability to not act on every impulse is what makes us a better human being. Mm. Tweet that podcast, Sean. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could drop this mic. <laughs> pull this off of here. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, there are a couple others. Maybe we'll just find one more that makes a little bit of sense it's, here. Dude, it's, I, cannot, I just can't believe how well that movie held up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, ah, oh, yes, 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 yes. Morpheus. So, of course, all the best lines are from Morpheus. Um, have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? 
what would you how would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world and and i think sometimes like we get so caught up in the dream world of Dude, sentimentality, sentimentality is the first thing I think of. The dream world it's is the dream world of, of 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 sentiment. Yeah, and I I think of nostalgia. Yes, yeah, it's very similar things. Right. Yeah. Right. And and I think those two things are often related, right? Like mm. we hold on to these sentimental items only because of the nostalgia, right. and that's the danger of nostalgia. It's it's this dream world because that world didn't actually exist. When, I remember like we 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 were filming this new documentary, uh, The Minimalist Slesses Now, and we were back at my old childhood home. Um, down there in Warren County, Ohio. You bought and it. You bought the place. No, no because no, of how no. sentiment it was. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I I didn't have the forty dollars on me. <laughs> Dude, I I wouldn't buy that. You couldn't give me that house. Oh it was, it's God. boarded up, man. Oh my God. Um. Anyway, That's like, like a knockdown. Anyway, yeah. but like I do remember, like I, just being in the old neighborhood and, and having like this good feeling. But there was nothing. I mean, generally nothing good about it. There was ten percent good, ninety percent bad. But then like for whatever reason like these the, the nostalgia oh yeah the comfort of whatever but it's just, that's just pulling forward the the good stuff that's a dream world because the real world of back then was chaos it mm. was electricity being cut off it was oh we don't ha- we didn't pay the water bill this month so it got it got turned off it, it was it was a different world and, yeah. and so like yeah being able to wake up from the dream world is what minimalism has allowed me to do all right, um, I think that's it for my added value, Ryan. What's adding value to your life recently? Well, it's funny, man, because um, the so we we know someone who works for Lululemon, uh-huh. and remember they they wanted to give us some clothes to try out. Yeah, Aaron. Yeah, and 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 I'm assuming it's because you know they want us to they want to have our buy in because if you can get the minimalist to buy into your product, right, then it must be a really really good product, right. And uh, uh, our, our good friend, Dr. Ryan Green, um, he has went way out of his way to like just you know tell me how much he really enjoys these products. So I know you went and they mm-hmm. tried to give you some stuff for free. Oh, they yeah. did give it to you for free. They did, yeah. But then you uh, you went and donated some money in their name. Yeah, so I... I, I, what I, what, what <laughs> you I found did, out exactly how much it was. Well, so uh, Aaron gave me... And I actually wear the, the Lulu Lemon jacket they gave me. Yeah. Uh, and I have a long sleeve t-shirt. It's very similar to this that they gave me that I that uh, I really like. Yeah. Uh, the jacket, I especially like. I probably wear that thing almost every every day. Um, and I was wearing it this morning like when I was doing my stretches. And, and so they gave me these things and I just tallied up what... Uh, so she wouldn't let me pay for them. Mm. And so I just like went on their website when I got home and I tallied up the amount and I added it up and I just donated that to givewell.org. Right. And I took a screenshot of the donation. I sent it to Aaron. And I said, here you go. It's donated in, in, in your name. So it's funny because I didn't really even think about taking those things for free. Like I, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. And then you kind of explained to me your thought process behind it, which actually, why don't you explain your thought process behind not taking something for free? Well, because then I feel compelled to talk about it positively and then also if i do talk about it positively then i i've i feel like i've been bought in some way yeah you don't want to owe anyone anything exactly so yeah. so th- keeping that in mind because i did want to try out the products mm-hmm. i just i didn't tell aaron i was going i just went and bought uh actually this pair of pants this pair of pants and this lovely shirt that i'm wearing now most comfortable freaking i love their t-shirts mm-hmm. and this is a thing it may not be an awesome t-shirt for you. Right. It may not be an, an awesome t-shirt for anyone listening to this, but I'll say like, I'd really find their t-shirts really comfortable and this pair of like athletic sweats that I bought. They do a really good job of, 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 of with men's apparel. I just had no idea. Cause I always thought of Lululemon as like this Yogi, you know, uh, I had to like go to yoga class and, and, you know, drink caramel macchiatos, yeah. uh, in order to wear Lululemon. Yeah. Um, and be a woman too. I didn't realize they made, <laughs> they made apparel for men. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it's like, it's, 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 it's actually, I really do enjoy their brand. And the one thing I really appreciate about them, and I'm not just, we are not getting paid for this, by the way. Like I, I really appreciate this brand because of that, the saying that they have, I forget exactly how it goes, but it's something about, uh, people who sweat together, build stronger relationships. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's absolutely true. Like it's um, when I think about like Dr. Ryan Green and I, th- uh, we hang out the most uh, with with exercising in some way, going to the gym, going to Soul Cycle. Uh, we just did this like uh, Nike um, uh, training class. Like the relationship I have with him 
Um, it feels much different than a, a relationship I have with someone when I just hang out with them every once you know once in a while and go to the comedy comedy club or or go to the the movies or whatever. Yeah. Like there's a much different type of relationship being built there, mm-hmm. and I I never even thought about that until I heard uh, Dr. Ryan telling me. Um, about their their philosophy, so I, I I definitely will recommend them. The other thing I'll recommend too is retired, inspired by Chris Hogan. I think you already recommended it on one podcast, but maybe a long time ago. Yeah, I'm going to recommend it's a solid it again. Book, man. Here's the thing, dude. You know, it's so a lot of a lot of people, um, a lot of my mentoring students, uh, they they got money problems. A lot of people have money problems. Mm-hmm. If you have money problems and you don't have a budget, stop talking about your money problems. Like it fresh because every single book I read, it starts with a budget and it's so true. Yeah. If you've got money problems, come up with a budget. Mm-hmm. Do not bitch about any of your money problems until you've come up with a budget. Then let's talk about and your- the budget you're sticking to. Right. Like, exactly. It goes back to that, that, the thought experiment where you're like, well, yeah, I have a budget, but I don't stick to it. Well then you don't, I mean, you, maybe you have a, a theoretical budget. Yeah, but- I'm not, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm not trying to undermine people's money problems. I'm not trying to. To say that you know uh, managing money is easy, I'm not trying to you know undermine the the actual problems people do have. Ryan, you and I had money problems for the first 31 years of our lives. Yes, it's absolutely when we were poor and when we were wealthy. Yes, uh, all I'm trying to say though is that if you're someone out there listening to this and you're like, oh, I got all these money problems and the minimalists they don't understand and 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 and, and why would they even say that? Come up with a budget first. Yeah. And then talk to me about, about your money problems. Yeah. The budget is is so key into uh in, into having um no money problems or making those go away, however you want to look at it. Yeah. Well speaking of, of Chris Hogan, I, I think it's a great book. He has a good podcast as well. It's also called called Retire Inspired. Yeah. And uh, he talks about retirement. But he does so in a way that he frames it for people our age. I mean, the problem with retirement is we start thinking about it when we're like in our late fifties or something. Yeah, and that's better to think about it when you're fifty-five than when you're seventy-five. And all of a sudden you're like, well, I should probably think about this whole retirement thing. It's uh, the best time to plant a tree was twenty years ago. The mm-hmm. second best time to plant a tree is now, and so now is the best time to think about retirement. If you're sixteen years old and you're listening to this, we have a lot of teenagers listening now. Now's the time for you to start thinking about retirement. You know, Bex and I just revamped uh, the way she's doing retirement, and she's maxing out her Roth IRA, and she's uh, trying to max out a SEP IRA, which is like a it's in, you and I have a SEP IRA as well. Mm-hmm. It's like an individual 401k for self-employed people, basically, mm-hmm. right? And so um, you can see, well, you can see my retirement accounts if you're interested in that over at theminimalists.com slash retirement. You can see how my retirement is set up and we set up something similar for Bex. She has a Roth IRA though. Um, I have a traditional, um, you can read why on, on that, that post there. But um, And then also if you want to budget, uh, Every Dollar is a great app that we've talked about before where Dave Ramsey's team has put that together. And then also uh, our budget, the budget you and I put together is the minimalists.com slash freedom. And uh, people can find that. We'll put links to those in the show notes. Yeah, but yeah, well. it's yeah, I agree. It's a great book. I want to go back to the Lululemon thing for a second because there's one thing I forgot to mention. Go for it. The clothes that they make, like this t-shirt, it's called the five-year t-shirt. Uh-huh. Like it's, I think it's 50 bucks, uh-huh. but like it is meant to last for at least five years. Gotcha. Which I really appreciate the... Uh, the they they factor in the wear and tear on your yeah. clothes yeah and and it, and and that's important because it goes back to the question i think it was nick that asked earlier about yes, quality you, versus quantity right 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 and and i mean sometimes I, and by the way it doesn't mean that um again like, like you said it doesn't mean that that shirt will necessarily work for someone else mm-hmm. but you know if you are buying that that you're you're getting some sort of quality if if you can afford it. If you can afford it, I tend to spend more up front if it's worth spending mm-hmm. more up front. Yeah. Because otherwise you're gonna pay for it on the back end. Yeah. Yeah, pay for it and letting go, which that's a, a cost in and of itself. All right, let's move on to right here, right now. It's where we talk about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists. We'll be with Chris Hogan really soon. Uh, and some other folks from Dave Ramsey's team. We're going out on the Simply Southern tour. We're talking about money and minimalism. We're gonna be in Alabama. And we're going to be in Kentucky, and we're going to be in Tennessee. We're going to be with Rachel Cruz, Chris Hogan, and Anthony O'Neill, one person in each of those three cities. We're going to talk about money and minimalism. 100% of the profits go to the Gym City Market, the nonprofit food co-op that we're trying to help build in our hometown of Dayton, Ohio, which has one of the largest food deserts in the entire country. Mm. Dayton, Ohio is also the second hungriest city for families in the United States. So 
If you want to help out with that, you can attend. If you're anywhere in the South, I've already, ha- well, actually, I've heard we have a couple people from Canada coming down to the Louisville stop, which is good news. Uh, it looks like the Nashville uh, stop is going to sell out relatively soon. We definitely need your help in Louisville and Birmingham as well. So so if you are thinking about coming, go ahead and come on out. 100% of the, of the profits that Ryan and I make are going to go to the Gym City Market. If you want to contribute to the Gym City Market outside of that, if you want to help us build this food co-op, you want to donate some money for my 37th birthday, head on over to theminimalists.com slash Dayton. You can read more about the the co-op, when it's going to be built, how they're going to help serve families in West Dayton, which by the way, doesn't have a single grocery store in the entire West side of Dayton right now. Um, The last 30 days or last month for 30 days, rather, Ryan, so all of June, we recorded Living Room Conversations. Living Room Conversations. (laughs) Man, that's our theme song. Um, (laughs) Well, that was the theme song whenever Ryan joined me. So Ryan joined me for at least a handful of these. That's how how you know I was there. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) I, I brought some other special guests on. Bex was on for one of them. Actually, she was on for... Three of them, if you if you see her in the background of two of them, she was like doing a workout during a couple of them that I <laughs> that I recorded. But uh, she uh, she actually answered a question about minimalism for families with me as well. I brought Ella on for one of them. Uh, how many toys should kids own? Her and I talked about how many toys she should own. And um, oh, we brought TK Coleman on talk about quitting a job that you hate. Yeah. So here are some of the questions that we answered over at the living room conversation. This is oh, by the way all on our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash the minimalists. What steps do you need to take for the minimalist life to happen? How much stuff should you get rid of? How can I get the whole family on board with minimalism? What if you can't turn your passion into a career? How do you get rid of things you might need in the future? How many toys should your kids have? How do minimalists handle one-time purchases? What do minimalists do for fun? When is it okay to throw away my partner's things? What do you think about downsizing your home when you have kids? How do you deal with criticism? How do you quit the job you hate? Should you break up with your girlfriend if she is not a minimalist? How do you introduce minimalism to a friend? How do you get people to stop buying you gifts? Why does minimalism why doesn't minimalism? Why doesn't minimalism have color, style, or personality? <laughs> What's one item you'd grab if your house was on fire? When have you taken minimalism too far? What should you do with your old photos, school books, DVDs, and VHS tapes? What is your budget for clothing? How do you let go of sentimental items? What books do you recommend to get out of debt? What's the difference between advertising and marketing? What's one thing you've let go recently? What's one thing you regret minimizing? As a minimalist, what items do you keep in your car? We did, we did a field trip to my car when I was at, at LAX picking you guys up from the airport. Uh, I got this question and I'm like, oh, all right, well, I've got my car here. Let's just take a field trip and I show you the four things that I keep in my car. Um, what do you carry in your pockets every day? I did a video here where I just emptied all, all my pockets and, <laughs> and show people what I kept in my pockets. And you'd actually be surprised. I probably keep more things in my pockets than a lot of people. Uh, do you ever want to quit social media? How do you avoid procrastination? And how do the minimalists spend their money? I'll tell you, I really enjoyed the experiment. I'm certainly not going to do videos every single day because that became stressful after a while, which I try to do a video every day. But uh, I could see doing a regular thing, you know, living room conversation once a week and answering questions. So you can join us over at the YouTube channel and we'll do more of these living room conversations. Maybe we'll get uh, Ryan over to my house more often to do, to do these and we'll post them occasionally over on the YouTube channel. Let's see what else we have going on. Mention my birthday. Oh, speaking of YouTube channel, if you check out the video version of this podcast, if you want to see the video version of this podcast, we put it up a day early now. So this podcast usually comes out on Tuesdays. The video version, because of a whole complicated series of events that has to happen to get this thing out on time, the video version is up a day early. So it comes out on Mondays. If you want to see this podcast a day early and see Ryan's beautiful face (laughs) and his flowing hair. And all his hair product. Oh, keep going. All his glory. Also, if you want to get the show notes to every episode of the podcast, you can just enter your email address over at theminimalists.com. That'll give you access to all the show notes in your inbox. We'll never sell or give away your email address or send you any spam. But you'll also get any new writings, any new essays, any new articles that we write over at theminimalists.com. Just enter your email address over at the top. Ryan, what else we got? You know I got those voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Here, check them out. Hello, Minimalists. This is Becky from England. I just wanted to send a message 
for anyone who is considering minimizing their social media usage. Uh, So this is something I have battled with most of my adult life. I actually worked in social media, managed social media accounts for lots of brands, as well as checking my own personal accounts in the morning and in the evening. Um, And after being motivated by hearing how you guys were using your own accounts more mindfully this year, and listening to your podcasts, um, I decided to give myself 30 days off work and off using social media. So I had a social media detox and the important part here, and this is my tip for anyone that's wanting to do something similar, is to document how you're feeling in a journal. So maybe a few weeks before you delete your social media accounts, um, have a bit of a reflection on how you feel in yourself are you happy at where you are in your life at the moment how's your physical health how's your mental health are you sleeping well what about your relationships what do you spend your time doing every day you happy spending your time doing those things every day and I was able to carry on this journal um, into my digital social media detox so I was able to see what the changes were from that transition of having a life where you check social media and having a life where you don't check social media I think the changes are so subtle that we sometimes don't realize for you know little things for me like my memory improved because I was able to actually pay attention to things that were happening in the real world more so than when I was subconsciously always thinking about my social media accounts And I think these accounts have a hold on us in a way that we kind of don't even realise. So keeping a journal can be a really beneficial way to do this. I did keep a paper journal and then recycled it. Or you can keep an electronic journal, type on your laptop, whatever. Um, But it's these philosophies that when you look back after the 30 days can really help you make a decision as to whether your social media usage is giving you more positives or negatives. Um... And that can be the catalyst for making you decide that you want to delete your social media accounts permanently, which is the decision I made after the 30 days. I just had far too many positives um, happen in those 30 days and things that improved in my life that it kind of wasn't worth it. So it's, it's looking back over that journal and seeing if it's worth sacrificing all those things for. Um, So good luck if you do decide to have a social media detox and if you do decide that the, um, cons are bigger than the pros afterwards and you decide to come off social media forever then well done and enjoy life in the real world without incessant and relentless checking of your phone it is a wonderful place to be hi minimalists just wanted to share a great minimalist way to enjoy books um i know in my city of toronto you're able to get a library card and then you're able to sign in online and get ebooks and audiobooks for free straight to your phone you don't have to go to the library at all that's a great way to enjoy books you can have them on your phone and read them anywhere or listen to an audiobook on your commute and it's a great way to enjoy books and not have to stockpile them Hey, Ryan and Josh. This is Lauren in Colorado. I am responding to Sabrina, who called in uh, on the intentionality or intentions episode and was asking how she can uh, continue to remind herself of her intentions day to day once she has set them. And I had read an article once, I think I found it on LinkedIn, that recommended that you can set your password to email or to your computer or to your phone Uh, to somehow encompass your goals. So when I decided to go vegan, the word vegan was a part of my password. Um, You know, when I had certain goals to reduce my uh, environmental footprint, I used certain words to remind myself every day that I typed in my password that I was going to minimize waste or reduce waste. And so it was actually a really great tip, and I've used it for the past few years and found it to be really successful. All right, y'all, that's it for this episode. If you have a question for The Minimalists, give us a call, 406-219-7839. Remember, we're we're especially looking for questions about sex and sleep and jobs and business, and I think there was one other, Ryan, Um, love. The topic of love. And so if you have any questions that are loosely related, when you call up, just say, hey, my question is about love or whatever, and we'll make sure that your question makes it to the top of the list. Or you can call us with a question about anything else as well. And Or you could just send a, instead of calling in, you send a voice memo right from your phone, the podcast at theminimalists.com. And if you leave here with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people 
and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Bye. The Minimalists.